guess when it's streaming. Live Senator. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess uh, we'll get started. Um, so we're on the live stream. So uh, I guess welcome, first of all, everybody to the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs for the 130th legislature. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, we are live streaming on uh, YouTube. So you just wanna make sure to have your, your microphones muted. And I guess uh, welcome uh, as well to members of the public who are here. Uh, watching our committee's activities today. Um, it's good to see everybody, albeit uh, remotely. <laughs> uh, but before we get started <clears throat> with the committee's agenda, which I, I've cut and paste into the chat so that the members can see it. Uh, but before we get started, we'll uh, begin with committee introductions. Um, I'm happy to kick it off and then I'll kind of go down the committee list. Uh, so my name is Louis Lucchini. I'm the Senate Chair of the committee. I represent Senate District 7 which uh, encompasses most of Hancock County. Um, so I'll turn it over to our house chairman, uh, Representative Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Chris Chiazzo. I'm the house chair um, of the committee. I represent House District 28, which is Western Scarborough. Thanks. Senator Farron. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Farron. I represent Senate District 3, which is the majority of Somerset County in the Looking forward to, to being back on VLA. I served uh, in the 128th, Louis, was that? Yeah, with, with, in, the, in the house with, with uh, Senator Lucchini. So looking forward to being back onto the committee and, and uh, looking at the work we got to do. So thanks, everybody. Glad to have you back, Senator. Uh, next up, we have Representative Corey. Good morning, I'm Patrick Corey. I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Uh, Representative Harrington. Good morning, I'm Representative Matt Harrington. Uh, I represent part of the city of Sanford and House District 19. Uh, Representative Kinney. Good morning, I am Representative Kinney. I represent House District 99. I have nine towns in Western Waldo County and I hail from the little town of Knox where cows outnumber people. <laughs> Representative McCrate. Good morning, I'm Jay McCrate and I represent Harpswell, West Bath and part of Brunswick in the house and happy to be back on VLA, thank you. Representative Riley. Hi, I'm Representative Morgan Riley. I represent District 34, which is half of Westbrook, and I'm excited to uh, serve with you all on this committee. Representative Supica. Hi, I'm Rep well, I'm Laura Supica, and I represent District 126, a portion of Bangor. Sorry for pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> uh, Representative, it was, it was good. It was a good pronunciation. It happens to me the entire committee, so. I was gonna say, that, that, that brings back, you guys will be able to hear everybody butcher uh, the senator's name. <laughs> yeah, pretty much nonstop. <laughs> uh, Representative Tuttle, welcome back. 
Well, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, John Tuttle, uh, District 10, the other part of Sanford with Matt Harrington. Matt, we're on the same committee this year. That's sort of unusual. <laughs> and Representative Wood. Hi, I'm Barb Wood, uh, serving my <coughs> first term in the legislature and happy to be with all of you on VLA. I represent District 38, which is the western portion of the peninsula in Portland. Great. So I think that covers all of our legislators who are in the room. Um, I'll also introduce our staff. So this uh, session from OPLA, the Office of uh, Policy and Legal Analysis, we have Janet Stoko there in the blue box. Uh, we also have Sam Prower. I don't know if he's with us now. He's also at Transportation. So you probably see him, Senator Farron, down there a bit. Um, he'll be with us as well for some of our committee topics. And from uh, LIO, we've got our committee clerk, uh, Karen Montel, there in the top left on my screen. I don't know where it is for everybody else. Uh, so yeah, it'll just be an important thing to uh, keep your eye on your inboxes for anything from uh, Janet, Karen, and Sam, because that'll pretty much have all the details for how to, to access one of these committee meetings and uh, all the documents that you'll need. Um, another thing that you'll often see, as Janet's done, she's turned off her uh, video. So if you do turn off your video, then you're off the YouTube stream, just so you know. Uh, as it runs now, it kind of shows the Hollywood squares of all the boxes is, is what's streaming online. Um, so, obviously, this is our first uh, remote hearing, so I appreciate everybody's patience as we <laughs> work our way through this. I'm sure that I'll run into some technical difficulties around along the way, but um, I think as, as Senator Farron alluded to earlier, the, the VLA committee, um, you know, we've, uh, we tend to be a pretty group. It's a pretty fun committee to work on. Um, covers a really broad range of topics, which you can see in the, the committee web webpage. Um, everything from veterans issues to election law, campaign finance, uh, gambling, we've got alcohol issues, kind of a new addition to the committee is, is marijuana. Um, so we bounce around a lot from topic to topic and uh, the house chairman and I will try to, to keep it on topic or group topics together as much as possible just to make it a little easier to navigate. Um, generally, we're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday committee on the day on our approved days of the week. Uh, generally speaking, we'll try to keep it to Monday and Wednesdays, just out of respect for everybody else's regular jobs. Um, until we start getting super busy, then we'll pick up Fridays. Or on a week like this, where we have a Monday holiday, then we'll pick up Fridays. But we'll definitely try to to keep it Monday, Wednesday as much as possible, just out of respect for everybody's time. Um, and in terms of committee start times, uh, like on Mondays, we'll generally start around 9 a.m. Just, uh, and it's usually will be public hearings with some of the bills that we've gotten. Uh, Wednesdays will probably be 10 o'clock. Um, and of course, you know, we'll talk with our, our chairs and leads. If you need time to caucus or do anything like that, we can adjust the schedule accordingly. Um, so I guess we have a, a few technical reminders that, um, that Janet has sent over. Um, as the members can see, if you have any IT issues as the hearing goes, uh, she's put the phone number for the for LIT office in the in the chat. Uh, the chat is is uh, supposed to be only used for um, technical things like IT issues, not for any substantive conversations, as that's not part of the the public. Uh, the public can't see it. So if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat or call that number. Uh, remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Um, we can't unmute people, so uh, but but we can mute people if there's a hot mic going or something. We can try to turn it off. Uh, it's obviously easy to sometimes click the button inadvertently. Um, if you turn off your video, as we said earlier, you'll you'll no longer be displayed on the YouTube feed. Uh, if you would like to speak or have any questions, we ask that you use the raise hand function. Um, and then the chairs will call on you. So there's, a, I guess, a couple versions of Zoom. So for some, the 
uh, raise hand is located under the participant link, the participant list uh, at the bottom uh, taskbar of your screen. So you, you would basically just click on that or the three dots that are um, on your screen near that. For newer versions of Zoom, this is the one that I have. There's a little smiley face thing that says reactions at the bottom. So if you click that, there's a little raise hand thing and then a hand like pops up in the top left corner and you get bumped over there so that um, we can see you uh, raising your hand. Great, and, and Janet has given me good advice on how to save your Zoom invites to an electronic calendar. So it's helpful because we're gonna get Zoom invite after Zoom invite. Um, so it's an easy way to find the link. I haven't quite figured it out, but she's still explaining it to me. So <laughs> it is a much simpler way when I get it to work to find that link. Um, so we have uh, Senator DeChambeau with us as well. If you'd like to introduce yourself, Sue, it'd be great. <laughs> I think you might be, I think you might be muted. Represent our uh, senator. Okay, great. There you uh, go. I apologize for being late, but uh, I was at Walgreens getting a COVID test, with, so we'll see. Um, yes, I'm Senator Susan DeChambeau from. Um, I live in Biddeford, and I represent um, a bunch of surrounding towns. And I am chair of Criminal Justice Public Safety. Um, that's great that I'm with VLA, but it meets the same day, same time. I'm next door in criminal justice. So I'll be bouncing back and forth, I guess. So thank you. Good to have you, Senator. Great. And so our uh, committee agenda, which I, I did cut and paste into the um, chat box, so we're gonna to start today uh, at roughly 10 a.m. with the Secretary of State's office. So generally we'll start with just the committee briefings for everybody just to uh, get everyone familiar with the topic areas that we cover um, here in VLA. Uh, we have scheduled, as you probably saw from Karen's um, email, we've scheduled public hearings uh, for the first batch of bills that we've gotten. Um, we have public notice requirements as you're all I'm sure aware. So. Uh, we have to give two weeks notice before we can hear them. So that will be the first week of February is when we're gonna start going through those bills. Um, and it's kind of, as they come up from the revisor's office, we will schedule uh, for hearings. And if there's any bills that are related to, to COVID, we'll try to take those early. So if there's anything, flag it for us, feel free to, to call the, your leads or chairs anytime. Let us know that there's something that needs to be addressed early and we can try to uh, hear the bill and work it relatively quickly so we can get it to the floor for the first uh, full session. So with that, I think that's it for the general introduction piece. Like I said, we'll start at roughly 10 with Secretary of State. We'll have uh, Secretary of State Bellows, uh, Dave Lachance, and Julie Flynn uh, coming in for that. At 10.30, we'll move to the uh, Ethics Commission, and Jonathan Wayne will be here for that. And then at 11, we'll have Department of Public Safety um, and the Gambling Control Unit, which falls under our jurisdiction as well. Uh, after that, we'll take a break and then we'll come back at one o'clock for more of a staff orientation uh, uh, meeting, which we'll have uh, our analysts as well as OFPR uh, kind of give us a rundown of how things will work. Um, we're still getting used to the different functions now and uh, our committee clerk, Karen, will be running a lot of the, the digital stuff. So she'll have to be at her desk running that the entire time. So we have a few minutes, Janet. I don't know if you had anything you, you'd like to add before we get uh, to our presentations. I'm happy to walk people through the website now. I was planning on doing it at one, but we can start now just to fill some sure. time if you want. That sounds great. Okay. So now I have to figure out how to share my screen again. First, get on the right page before I share it. I want to put you on the spot with that. <laughs> it's all right. It would happen at some point. Yeah. 
Actually, while, while uh, Janet's getting ready, I just wanted to remind everybody, we also have uh, appropriations on the 28th, which is a Thursday next week. Before we forget about that too. So that's an off day. Just a reminder, it should be in your calendar. You guys should see invites and stuff for that already, but just uh, keep that in mind. Yes, yeah, and Karen will send out the weekly schedule when she has a moment. She's extremely swamped at the moment trying to run this meeting, but she will send it out before she leaves today. Okay, hopefully you can see my web page. Yep. Sometimes when I move it to my other screen, that disappears. So did it disappear? You're good so far. Okay. Um, one thing with sharing screens is sometimes it's too small for people. So if it is, um, you might just want to interrupt me. Generally speaking, I think the chairs want people to use the raised hand function, but we've discovered that when you're sharing a screen, that doesn't really work very well. So I don't mind if you interrupt me. They mind, might mind if you interrupt them, however, so I'm not gonna speak for them. Okay, Janet, can, can you hold on just a second? So I think we have a question from Representative Kinney. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, yes, I hit, I hit the raise hand just as she was saying, no, no, that it doesn't work. Um, okay. I'm currently on my phone. I'm trying to get onto my computer. Um, so I see in the screen is really small for me, but, um, at the same time, this is my fourth term, so hopefully like that screen looks very familiar, but um, I may have some difficulty until I can get onto a bigger screened device. Okay, I'm gonna unzoom it for just a second, just to show people this left-hand bar, but then I will zoom it up for you, okay? Um, so this is the legislature's homepage, um, handy to just bookmark it on your web browser that you use generally. And I just wanted to show you first on the left-hand side here in the dark color are the more hot news items. And what may be of interest to you here, you probably already know about it, is the top left-hand item. If you click on it, it'll bring you to another thing that you have to click again. Sorry, you have to click twice. But then you will be brought to a list of all of the bill titles that were submitted before cloture sorted by sponsor. So if you wanna make sure you see all of your bills, you can handily get that list here sorted by subject if you wanna see the ones where um, the revisor's office in their preliminary review of the intake thought it might come to this committee. It's not a guarantee it will, but it's their preliminary review. You can look here on the by subject and you can also see bills sorted by department and agency. I did wanna warn you, however, that um, these are preliminary working titles. It says it right on that um, link because as the bills are drafted, the sponsor might realize that maybe the title doesn't exactly match the context or the revisor's office might say, you know, when we're looking at this, we think this title might be a little more accurate. So when the bill comes to committee, if it does in the future, uh, the title might be slightly different, but it does give you an idea of where we're um, going to go this session. On the homepage, I think I sent this out to the IP list. So if you're on the IP list, you may have received it, but if you didn't, I did wanna let you know if you're ever speaking to anyone who wants to watch a VLA meeting, right in the middle here uh, uh, in front of the state house picture is a link to committee. So we're gonna click on that in a second and I'll show you what you can find there. But on the bottom is YouTube channels. If somebody clicks here, they're gonna see all of the different YouTube channels for each different committee. So if they wanna watch criminal justice and they know it's Friday, if they click on YouTube channels, they can come right here and click criminal justice and they'll be all set. Obviously we want them to click Veterans Legal Affairs, but I wanted to give a shout out to Senator DeChambeau's committee. Yeah. So if we click here on committees, and sometimes it's slow, it's slower for me at home than it is here in the office. Janet, I'm sorry, Representative Corey has a question. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, is it just me or like the the window that we're looking at right now isn't got the mouse on it or um, isn't um, going from page to page? It's still the static front page of the legislature's yeah. website. I've got the same representative. So yeah, it wasn't clicking when you clicked on the committee page there, Janet. This is good to know. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We'll try again. And if it doesn't work, then we'll have to wait to the afternoon to see if we can fix it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, every, every time we've tested it in Opla, it worked, <laughs> of course. 
I found that two screens makes everything difficult, but it's super helpful to look at other, you know, re be, being able to access other things. Do you see it now? Yep, it's moving now, so I think it's working. Okay, so this top link we're gonna go to in a second is the committees, it's right in front of the state house. The bottom is the YouTube channels. They click on that. I'll just show you what I tried to show you before. They'll be brought to a page that shows every committee's YouTube channel. So they could do criminal justice and public safety, or they could pick um, veterans and legal affairs. They're of course not by alphabetized. So they'd have to find us here right before IFNW and after transportation. We have this great picture of a veteran. So that's how they can find us. Um, if they go to the committee page, however, and this is the page that sometimes loads slow, and this may not work for everybody. Can you still see that I'm selecting the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee? Okay, because yeah. it froze on my screen for a second. I didn't know it froze for you. So we are the best committee. So the, we're the very last one because you saved the best for last. Like and then you that. click on Veterans and Legal Affairs and you'll be brought to our committee page. Um, it looks a little funky here because I've zoomed in, hopefully to help Representative Kinney, although it may still be too small for her, in which case I do apologize. Um, but there is a lot of important information on this page. I'm gonna start at the very bottom. Um, at the very bottom on the left-hand side, there is a list of every committee member. And so if somebody wants to email you, they're just gonna click the plus sign next to your name and they'll get your legislative email address. They'll get your um, address that you've given the legislature for how people can mail things to you. And they'll basically see all of the committee members and they'll see links to all of the committee staff. Mike Russo and Suzanne Boynick, you're gonna meet this afternoon and they're from the fiscal office and then Sam Prower and myself. And I'm not gonna repeat the best for last thing, but you can see who's listed last there. Um, <laughs> if you go up a little bit on the right hand side, there's the weekly schedule. So this will be sent to you by email by Karen. Usually you'd have it sort of at the horseshoe for you to see, but you can also just pick it up right here. If you click on that, it's gonna download the Word document. So it's not worth it for me to click it and show you because you wouldn't see it anyway, but that's how you can get the weekly schedule. All public hearing notices for hearings that are upcoming are here as well, if you're interested in finding them because you do get them in your email, but maybe your email is full like mine. So you can just click here instead if you wanna remind yourself what's gonna be heard what day. The middle of the screen shows people what's going on today. So today we have this legislative meeting at 9.30. I hope you remembered to attend. And then also you'll have the link here to the audio. I don't believe that the audio only works this week because the IT department's been quarantined. So, um, but starting next week, I believe that just the audio only will work. That's what I've been told anyway, is that it doesn't. So if somebody tells you they couldn't hear it today, tell them they can watch the YouTube and it is being recorded so they can watch it after today's meeting. If somebody comes straight to the VLA webpage, they can find the YouTube link here. Like I said, I blew up the screen, so it's a little hard to see, but if you unblow it up, you'll see that the YouTube can be easily found. But I'm gonna blow it back up for a second. And then the most important thing probably for today, so it's good that we had a few minutes before the Secretary of State's presentation, is this committee materials button. So if somebody were to click on committee materials, they'll be brought to the page where our office um, posts different documents before meetings. We'll try our very best to post them before meetings, but you can imagine with 13 different committees, a whole bunch of analysts and everybody thinking their documents are the most important documents to post. And unfortunately, a very clunky program to post them that requires, I think it's like six or seven steps. Um, sometimes we won't be able to get them posted before the meeting. We'll definitely email them before the meeting, but if we can get them up here before the meeting, we will. So if if you wanted to look at some orientation materials that we're gonna talk about today, you'd click right on orientation materials. You can see all of the handouts OPLA and the fiscal office created that you can look at. If you click right on them, you can look at each one. And then at the bottom of that page, we started posting the agency briefing materials. So at this point, we only have the materials for the people who are briefing you today but um, there will be more briefings on Monday and I believe um, Bablo has something that they want you to see. So we'll have that posted later today or maybe over the weekend, depending on how busy the secretaries are in our office. 
um, if you don't see it here and you wonder, was there supposed to be something, just shoot me an email and I'll definitely talk to you about it. Uh, we can talk more about the website later, but I think I've gone right up to almost 10. So I'm gonna unshare for now. Great, thank you, Janet. And as Janet said, we'll, we'll go through kind of a full orientation this afternoon where we can get into more um, issues like that. Um, but now it, it is 10 o'clock and I see we've got uh, the Secretary of State with us. Uh, welcome, Secretary of State Bellows. Um, thanks for coming in today and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee of the 130th. I am Secretary of State Shana Bellows and it is my sincere pleasure to be here with you today. I'm also accompanied by my distinguished colleagues, uh, Deputy Secretary of State for Corporations, Elections, and Commissions, uh, Julie Flynn, uh, and Director of Finance and Administration, uh, David Lachance. They're here to answer any questions that you might have that I can't answer. Um, listening online today are other members of the department, our Director of Elections and the Administrative Procedure Act, uh, Melissa Packard, is listening online and I'm really lucky to have the Honorable Dottie Canelli. She is staying on as my Chief Deputy. Pat Condon is staying on as Director of Constituent Services. And Emily Cook, who many of you know from her work in the Senate, has joined my office as my Special Assistant. So if you need anything at all from the Department of Secretary of State, we are here to serve you. And I know from experience that constituent services is vital to the work that you do, and it's very important to all of us as well. So I want to go um, right into the overview that was supplied to you that Janet showed is also available on the website. I'm just gonna give you some highlights and then you know we'll open it up to questions that Julie and Dave and I are happy to answer uh, that you might have. Um, so. Big picture perspective, the Division of Elections supervises and administers all state elections for federal, state, and county offices, as well as all of the referenda. This is an incredibly complex undertaking. It involves almost 500 municipalities, and in the previous election cycle, about 500 candidates. And that is just a coincidence that those are both about 500. So it's really remarkable um, and we supplied the organizational chart for you as well, uh, because something that um, is just crystal clear, it was a team of just seven staff working under the direction of Julie Flynn, doing all of the work that is described in this overview of activities and that I'm going to touch upon. So how did this tiny team uh, do that in a presidential election year? Julie reports to me that the team borrowed employees from elsewhere in the Secretary of State's office, including corporations, uh, the central office, and other bureaus. Additionally, the election staff logged 2,933 hours of overtime. Now, when Julie told me that for the first time, I took out the calculator app on my phone. That's 73 weeks of overtime, that's not a typo. It's 73 weeks of overtime in the division of elections. And that's 52, there are 52 weeks in a year. So what we're talking about is a person and a half of overtime at least. So one of the important things that just want us to be mindful of as we move forward in 2021 is to acknowledge and address um, what I see is some concerning staff shortages. Uh, Julie, and her director, Melissa, assistant director, uh, Heidi Peckham, they each put in nine weeks of overtime approximately each. It was a superhuman effort. I don't believe it's sustainable over the long term. So what was Julie and her team of seven people doing? Let's walk through it in the overview. There were seven elections, including the presidential primary, the July primary, and the general election. That included ranked choice voting with counts for six races, 
And there were three recounts, one pursuant to the July primary and two following the general election. It's important to note that Maine's elections include paper ballots. The paper ballot is an important security measure. The technology we use for elections includes tabulators manufactured by ESNS. Um, it's also important to note that ESNS tabulators are never connected to the internet, so they are not vulnerable to hacking by malicious actors. ENS, ESNS also provides the software that the Division of Elections utilizes to provide camera-ready uniform ballots. That's a contract that we entered into in 2012. It's the department's intention to go out for RFP in 2021. And our goal with that RFP is to do so collaboratively with as many municipalities participating as possible to have uniformity across the state. Ballot layout, coding, and testing is time intensive. It's critical to ballot accessibility for voters. So in our overview, we have detailed the time involved with the ballot layout, coding, and testing because it is significant. Moving down in the report, another critical piece of technology is the central voter registration system, the voter file. We implemented this system in 2007. Nearly 14 years later, we are at a crossroads. Do we move forward with upgrades of our existing system or invest in a new central voter registration system? The CVR is critical for the accuracy of the voter list. Cybersecurity is also a huge consideration. The Department of Secretary of State has an incredibly experienced information services team with state-of-the-art protections in place for the CVR. So as we move forward, with the CVR, it will be important to contemplate future reforms, like online voter registration, should the legislature decide to move forward with that, and improved automated list maintenance. Another important consideration is online interfaces and applications uh, that will be facilitate automatic voter registration as directed by the 129th legislature. Our information services team is testing applications now that we may be able to install, and that is our hope and goal, at the Bureau of Motor Vehicle branches for automatic voter registration. But we need to ensure that in connecting the public-facing application to the secure central voter registration system, we continue to maintain the highest levels of data security. We must plan our technology investments to advance efficiency, accessibility, and security. And given the increasing sophistication of external threats, especially cyber threats, and the demands placed upon us by federal and state laws, we need to make sure these investments are strategic and careful, and they won't always be cheap, but there is nothing more important than the integrity of our elections. In the overview, I share with you that the department does include, intend to conduct scheduled list maintenance activities and compliance with the National Voter Registration Act, the NBRA. That will entail sending a notice to every voter whose CVR record shows no voter participation history within the timeline outlined by the NBRA, and then either canceling or making voters inactive in accordance with the federal law. Voter registration and list management is foundational to election integrity. Next in the overview of activities, I would like to draw your attention to accessible voting systems. Uh, improvements continue to be made uh, to voting systems to improve accessibility for individuals with disabilities. In the report, we outline the express vote system now in place at every voting place. And in 2020, the division developed accessible electronic absentee ballots based on our UCAVA system that allows voters with print disabilities to request, vote, and return an absentee ballot using uh, screen reader technology in their own computer. Uh, also outlined in the overview is a report on the military and overseas voting. That's called the UCAVA. Um, they can request vote ballots via mail, fax, or other online absentee ballot request service. Finally, in the report, we detail uh, various other functions of the elections division below um, that includes youth engagement, 
citizen education, and as well as referendum management. Yesterday, for example, opponents of the Energy Corridor dropped off petitions with more than 100,000 signatures. Julie and her team of seven now must drop basically everything to manually check those signatures and verify their validity within the next 30 days. It's a big job. We're fortunate to have such a dedicated team uh, willing to take this on, going above and beyond uh, to get this done. So with that, I will conclude my introductory remarks and happy to have a conversation, answer um, questions that you might have um, about anything that I've touched on or anything that is in the report itself. Great, thank you, Secretary Bellows. And I can second, you know, from years of with working with the Deputy Secretary Flynn that you've got a great team over there that are dedicated and work super hard. And when they get an initiative dropped on them, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tough. And there's been times when multiple initiatives and vetoes were dropped simultaneously. and certainly a tough task. So does anyone uh, on the committee have questions at this point for the Secretary of State? Looks like none at the moment. Is uh, I guess, can you just give us a quick overview on the status of AVR? People have asked me about that. Um, and I think you touched Absolutely. on it a minute ago. Absolutely. But. So what that's going to require is, and, and what our goal is, is to have a tablet probably at the BMV branches where voters can enter in their information if they're not previously registered. And that can be communicated on the back end uh, to the office for connection with a CVR. So we're really, um, if you've been into a BMV branch lately, you will see that the windows are fairly um, small and fairly tech heavy on the back end BMV branches are doing a variety of functions. Um, so we're hoping to upgrade our um, ability to take credit cards at the branches and do AVR on the same application um, and again to have that probably in tablet form. So our information services team we have a uh, the Secretary of State's office has uh, a wonderful uh, IT department, uh, the collective experience in that department is superb. They are testing uh, applications that different vendors have submitted as a solution to that issue. And uh, we feel that we are on track at this point uh, to be able to implement AVR. One of the questions I've had from the very beginning is how do we think about future technology investments, particularly if we move forward either with upgrades to the current CVR system or a new CVR system, given that, again, as I mentioned in my remarks, we're coming on almost 14 years since we initially installed that system, which is a pretty lengthy uh, life for any technology. Um, we need to make sure that those systems can talk to each other so that the front end ideally will get to a place where that AVR application would facilitate online voter registration should the legislature want to move forward with that. Right, and, and the kind of interaction with the real ID system provides a lot of security on security measures as well, right? So the real ID system is connected to the driver's license system. So <laughs> um, one of the uh, just fascinating pieces about the Secretary of State's office. I mean, it's really an advantage that both the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and the Division of Elections is housed in the same department. Uh, we, because these systems were installed at different points in our history, they're all discrete and unique different systems, all of which have a fairly, um, our driver's license system also dates back to I believe it's 2006. And that system is actually not, um, it doesn't interface directly with the CVR. So how we connect systems or how that information exchange happens is an ongoing uh, process. Um, and of course, cybersecurity is really important. One of the benefits of having systems that don't talk to each other is it reduces your vulnerability to outside threats. One of the disadvantages is it reduces automation and efficiency. 
Uh, Representative Wood. Hi, Secretary Bellows. Um, as you know, I'm new and trying to get used to all the acronyms and everything. Um, I just wondered, uh, I'm making a bunch of assumptions about what AVR is. <laughs> And I just thought maybe you could take a minute and just give me a little more detail. So automatic voter registration is not online voter registration. Right. The difference is automatic voter registration would be that ideally in the long term, but the legislature in the 129th um, started with the BMV branches, uh, that voters, when they're interfacing with government, would be given an opportunity to automatically register to vote in that moment. So a citizen of Maine walking into a Bureau Motor Vehicle branch would be able to register to vote at the Bureau of Motor Vehicle branch automatically. Um, that's automatic voter registration. Online voter registration is when a voter is able to go online and register to vote. Maine does not currently authorize online voter registration, and part of that is our technology um, is not designed to facilitate that. So uh, many states are doing online voter registration, but online voter registration and automatic voter registration are not necessarily the same thing, and under Maine statute are definitely not the same thing. And I want to invite Julie, would you like to put a finer point on that? Um, our uh, deputy secretary is just a gem. She is so incredibly experienced. Um, Julie, if you want to add anything to that explanation. She's muted. Julie, you're muted. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the benefit of uh, automatic voter registration, which the legislature passed uh, two years ago, is that currently when you go to a motor vehicle branch office, you're offered a chance to fill out a paper voter registration application, which gets collected at the branch, transmitted over to the elections division, and we spend hours each day sorting them by town so that we can mail them to the municipalities we're passing a lot of paper and there's a chance for things to go astray. So when you're completing your motor vehicle transaction, you'll be offered not an opportunity to fill out a separate application, but to take the data that's already from motor vehicles that you've already provided, add the questions that relate only to voter registration, put that together and transmit it electronically into the CBR system so when a town logs in, let's say I'm registering in Wyndham, the town logs in and they see they have a pending application, they still will review it and accept it if it's, it's complete, but it's eliminating all those steps of handling and mailing. And that's a huge, huge savings of time for us in the municipalities and also for the voters to make sure it's getting there quickly. Right, and, and Julie, the the requirement to offer voter registration at bureaus of motor vehicles is from federal law, correct? It's part of the National Voter Registration Act, or NVRA. Right. Um, that was implemented in 1995 before we even thought of all this computer automation. So this really is more of a modernization effort, um, at least in the, the motor vehicle step. Right. And Representative Wood, did you have a follow-up or all set? Okay. Uh, Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome. Congratulations, Secretary Bellows. Um, I wanted to just take the moment to say how you mentioned customer service, constituent service, and just say how phenomenal it has always been. And just I'm very grateful for that. Um, something we can always count on. People are treated very well, polite, and get answers, which is even nicer. Um, I was going to ask about, I think what um, Senator Lucchini just mentioned 
in the 129th automatic voter registration, I think there was some room for it to move further at, if it was ready to go to other sites, but I, I know we're not ready, but is that, is that in the, um, in the thinking still, or I, just an update on that? So I think it will be important, um, and with every aspect of elections administration, that we ensure that what we are doing as we take steps to modernize is working well. So it will take us at least a year. Um, again, we're in the testing phase just of, of receiving different application solutions, the different tablet solutions. We're testing those. Then they will need to be, uh, the, there will need to be coding um, and installation and then implementation. And we'll want to make sure that is working really well before we move to the next phase of looking at how it might work in other public facing governmental entities. So my goal is to make voting as convenient and accessible and secure as possible. That's the department's goal. And I think that any way we can increase voter participation and the opportunity for the citizens of Maine to enroll as voters and then exercise that franchise is an opportunity we need to pursue. And we need to do so in a deliberate and thoughtful way to ensure that we don't inadvertently um, create unintended consequences or problems for the voters. And so I, I think that's an absolutely laudable goal. This year, I think the focus does need to be on making sure we get it absolutely right at the BMV branches. And uh, we've talked, you know, Representative Wood's question about online voter registration is an important one. Um, that is a goal I have shared. I know that you will be seeing legislation. That is something uh, that I think the consumers are asking for, and we're seeing that work well in other states. And that may actually be something that we may want to pursue even before we start to install the application that we end up using at the BMV at other public facing entities across state government, because then people could register to vote from the comfort of their own living room rather than at the BMV office or the DHHS office. Thank you very much. That's great. Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of my um, concerns about AVR has always been uh, the registration of ineligible voters. So in Maine currently, you know, if you're 17 years old and there's a partisan primary coming up, yes, you're allowed to vote in that partisan primary prior to voting in the general um, when you turn 18. Probably my biggest concern here is that if we're registering 16 year olds, who is that's an ineligible voter, I don't know what's done with that voter data, whether or not that voter data becomes accessible to the parties so that they can start IDing children. Do you know what I mean? Based on their their voter registration and, and hitting them with mail and everything else. Is the information for ineligible voters shared with, with parties and other, other, other people that are pulling down voter lists? Thank you. I'm gonna ask, um... Uh, Julie, to answer that specific question, but I do want to touch on an important point that you've raised. As we move forward with automatic voter registration at the BMV, we are going to want to be very careful that uh, Mainers who are not eligible to vote are, are not inadvertently caught up in the system. Um, I think it would be disastrous if someone who were legally present and legally entitled to credentialing at the BMV, um, inadvertently, without knowing, registered to vote and then committed a crime that could lead to um, them losing their legal status. And so I think these are the types of, um, you know, so that policy exists. Obviously, you have to be a citizen to vote in Maine. And the but as we implement automatic voter registration, as we first select a technology solution, when I say coding, 
It is more complex than just a software developer on the back end coding the machine. We have to make sure that the steps on the machine help to preserve the integrity of the voter list and help to protect the um, manners as well, right? So Julie, to, to Representative Corey's larger question about what is shared out of the CBR with the parties, can you address that? The statute doesn't address it, but um, we're actually working on uh, fine tuning the, the pre-registration component of the CBR for 16 year olds. And we actually just yesterday talked about not including the 16 year olds uh, and only including the 17 year olds who are going to be 18 in that general election year so that they would be, they would be actual voters you know, for the general. So that's something we're working on right now. Thank you for, for answering that question. I don't think that information for ineligible voters should be shared with anybody. Thank you. Yeah. Great, do we have any other questions for the Secretary of State? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Secretary Bellows thank and you. Uh, Julie and David for uh, coming in today. And um, I'm sure we'll see you pretty soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care. Thanks. All right, so we'll uh, transition to the next item on our agenda. We're still a couple minutes early. Um, but next up at 1030 will be the main commission on governmental ethics and election practices. And uh, Director Wayne, who I saw earlier, I'm not sure if he's still on. Welcome, Director Wayne. Thank you. I just joined on the fly here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. Um, I received a suggestion that it might be helpful for me to share a, a doc, uh, sort of a document that I provided to Janet um, via my screen. May I take a second to do that? Would that be all right? Yes, absolutely. We might need to upgrade you to a co-host. Oh, well, I don't want to cause, only if it's easy. I don't want to cause any trouble. Well, I'm not sure either, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'll give it a go, and if it doesn't work out, um, let's. Oh, good. Do you see my screen, or do you see me, or? Yep, it's working. Oh, good, okay. Well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I've had the pleasure of working with about half of you, um, and uh, really look forward to getting to know you better during the session. Um, we, uh, you know, we usually provide information on bills um, when we have something that we want to add, but we're generally neutral on bills relating to campaign finance and, and the other areas of our jurisdiction. So we often provide just sort of background information and try to be as good a resource as we can. Um, uh, we will have some bills that we've put forward uh, being printed later on in the session. Um, and we thank you in advance for your consideration of those. Um, I thought I'd start with an overview of what we do um, uh, because we get to intersect with most of you as candidates, but sometimes the whole scope of what we do or don't do isn't really very well known. So we're a small independent agency within Maine state government. We're, we're not part of the legislature or the executive branch. Um, I'm the director of the staff uh, so we have a staff of six employees and um, I'm going to try to reduce my screen so you can see most of what's on page one here. Um, so I, you know, the, 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 the commission is made up of five private citizens who meet once a month, who make all of the, the, the final policy decisions and all of the enforcement decisions. And, and we as staff make recommendations to the members. Um, just to run through our members, they're in the middle part of the document that I'm sharing there. Um, our members are currently David Hastings, who's a former state senator, uh, Bill Schneider, who is a former state representative and former attorney general and, and former judge, uh, Bill Lee, who's an attorney in um, Waterville, and Mary Lowry, who uh, is a, a retired attorney, and 
Dennis Marble, um, who is one of our newest members and has just been a pleasure to work with. And I actually am not that familiar with Dennis's professional background, but he's been terrific. So we've got a great commission with three new members, but the election season went well and um, they're very engaged and eager to be more and more involved in the future. Um, just to go over our jurisdiction, we are the campaign finance agency for the state of Maine. So candidates register with us and file campaign finance reports, um, but also we receive reports and registrations from political action committees and ballot question committees, and they can be influencing ballot questions or candidate elections and also party committees. The three state party committees file reports with us, but also the county and municipal committees do as well. So as all of you know, we, we administer this through an, an electronic filing system. So we receive reports and registrations from all these sources. And as soon as the reports are filed, they go up onto our website for the public to be able to access and understand who's influencing elections, both on the candidate side and the ballot questions. Uh, one addition to our duties, uh, for about 20 years now is that we administer the Maine Clean Election Act. I included some data in the handout uh, that I sent to your analyst. Uh, right now, about 55% of the legislative candidates are participating in the Maine Clean Election Act program. And the program is also open to candidates for governor. Um, so that's, you know, anytime you're making grants to uh, people for political purposes, there's a lot of extra strings attached. So we're very active in reviewing the, the financial reports that we get from the Maine Clean Election Act candidates. Uh, we are just now uh, performing a, a random audit of 20% of the candidates. Uh, the letters relating to those candidates who've been selected randomly for the audit are actually going out in today's mail. Um, so some candidates will be receiving them soon. Um, so that's a major, major part of our duties. One thing that doesn't really come up so much with the VLA committee is that we are the lobbyist disclosure agency for the state of Maine. So uh, about, I think uh, it's fair to say about 125 lobbyists register with us on behalf of more than 300 clients. And they provide very detailed information on a monthly basis regarding how much the clients are compensating them, any expenses that they're taking on, any grassroots lobbying that they're doing. And they actually have to specify the bills uh, that they are working on uh, in those monthly reports. And similar to the campaign finance reporting, that is all entered into a database and made available to the public uh, for the public to understand which clients and which lobbyists are trying to influence legislation. Um, and then finally, we do have a little bit of legislative ethics jurisdiction. It's not a big part of what we do, um, but uh, we, are very happy to provide informal advice or more formal advisory opinions on issues that come up in the course of being a legislator. That's one part of what we're here to do. So if you are, say you work in the banking industry and there's a bill that comes up relating to financial services or banking, and you're wondering, hey, can I, this could affect my employer in some remote way, would this constitute a conflict of interest for me to, um, act on this, we are, that's one of the roles that we provide. That's one of the services we provide. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us on that type of issue or travel is another issue that sometimes people have questions about. If there's a, an association who wants to invite you to participate in a conference, either in state or out of state, and you wanna know whether you can accept that uh, assistance to, to get there or the accommodations or, you know, that kind of thing, or do you have to report it? We're happy to answer questions about that as well. So that's the scope of our, our jurisdiction. And let me just say what's not in our jurisdiction. We actually are not an ethics uh, agency like some states have for municipal employees and county employees. Some states like Massachusetts have uh, state agencies like that, uh, that, you know, uh, do enforcement relating to gifts or conflicts of interest. Maine, Maine has gone the route of not uh, assigning that to any state agency. So that's actually not part of our jurisdiction, but we get a lot of calls from the public who say, hey, you're the ethics commission. There's this aspect of uh, town government that I'm not happy with. Can you help me out? And we have to say, we're sorry, that's not really what we do. Um, so uh, I was going to Talk, just go over our staff, if you don't mind, and some of the projects we're working on. Um, uh, 
so I, I'm seeing nods. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. We, like I said, we are a small agency. We've got six employees. Uh, it's We are co-managed by myself and by Paul Lavin, who's the assistant director. And then we have two candidate registrars, Aaron Gordon and Emma Burke. So many of you have had some uh, interactions with Aaron and Emma, and I, and I hope they've been helpful. We, we, we try to adopt a customer service ethic ourselves. I mean, we, we also have a monitoring function, but we know that in Maine, most people who run for the legislature really wanna do the right thing in terms of registering and filing the finance reports and financing their campaigns. And they just have questions about, you know, how do we go about doing this? So uh, what we do is try to have as clear written guidance as we can and try to be absolutely as accessible as we can by phone or by email. So I hope that's been your experience. And we find, because some people do think of us as the election cops, because that's sometimes there's things that, you know, along those lines that, you know, enforcement matters that come up in newspaper coverage or radio coverage. But we find that if we are helpful with someone, say 10 times in the course of a few election seasons, if there's on the 11th interaction with them, we have to say no or sorry, you didn't quite live up to the standard that's set in law. The fact that we have a good rapport with them, they they know that we're there to help. We're not just there to stand in their way. Uh, so that that's our ethic along, along those lines. Michael Dunn is our political committee and lobbyist registrar. So he helps out the PACs and the ballot question committees and the party committees and also the lobbyists. And then Lori Brand is our commission assistant. That's our staff of, of six people. So I just wanted to focus on um, what we're working on this year. I pulled out four projects for your information. Um, one thing that it's important for you to know about is that um, in the past, legislators like executive branch officials have always filed a paper form with our, our office once a year that outlines the sources of their personal income. So I think all of you have filed this statement uh, either as an as a veteran legislator or as a legislative candidate. It, it, the statement has about 13 sections in it. And so if you have any kind of private employment by another, you list that. If you're self-employed, you list that. If you own a business, you list that and so on. Positions and boards and commissions and, and those types of things. Um, a little more than five years ago, the legislature required us to adopt an electronic filing system for filing those statements. This was uh, pursuant to a bill by Governor LePage and also Emily Kane that adjusted the requirements for what legislators had have, have to disclose in these statements. And part of that bill was to require our office to start receiving these statements electronically. So pursuant to that law, um, we've worked with our IT vendor um, for, to develop an e-filing system uh, for legislators and executive branch officials to file these reports online. So we are gonna be sending emails to the legislature next week containing a user, username and a password. And we've worked hard on the system and we've received some positive feedback from the executive branch officials who had to file their statements in April. And what it's designed to do, it's sort of intended to be kind of an update system. So if any of you, um, have a license online that you renew each year, you know that a lot of the information about yourself as part of that license application is the same year to year. And similarly, a lot of people's income sources don't change year to year. So what we have done is taken the uh, data that was given to us by legislators covering calendar year 2019, and we've entered all of that into a database in this e-filing system so that when legislators file this report in the next few weeks relating to 2020, uh, what they will do is um, they can import their data from 2019 with the press of the button into their 2020 report. And then they don't have to start from scratch by entering or handwriting all of that information into a form. It's already there. And the job of filling out the report is just going through the different sections and clicking a box and checking off that it's accurate or making any changes for 2020. So it's designed to save the filers time I really hope legislators find it easy to use, but we are happy to send out paper forms to legislators uh, who don't want to tackle it electronically. So that's going to be the subject of some emails next week. And if you have any questions about that, uh, I'll just pause in just a minute and have to answer questions about that. Um, 
Another task that we have just started is auditing leadership packs. Uh, we have uh, somewhere between, I think we're auditing 15 leadership packs uh, this spring. This was an initiative uh, that our commission chair directed us to do after uh, some enforcement matters that came to the commission's attention relating to leadership packs. Um, it's really just a process of asking for bank account statements and some invoices and comparing that to the finance reporting. And if there are discrepancies, we will uh, work with the PACs, uh, you know, to straight help them straighten out their reporting. If there are any violations, you know, we will be going to the PACs first and saying, "Here's what we found," and giving them an opportunity to talk about them. But really, the the main job of PACs is to file accurate finance reports. So, our first approach will really just to be asking them to amend the reports if we see any significant discrepancies or even minor discrepancies. We want the reports to be as accurate as possible. We have another uh, IT project coming up, which is for those of you that were in the Maine Clean Election Act program in 2020, um, we asked you to uh, create, enter all of the individuals giving you qualifying contributions into an online website that was developed by InformMe. And that website, uh, double checked whether uh, those contributors were registered to vote in their municipalities and were therefore valid and whether that helped you qualify for Maine Clean Election Act funds. That was the first time that function was added to the website. Uh, so we hope you had a good experience with that aspect of it. Um, one thing we would like to do is enhance that website as a communication tool with the candidates. We wanted to, to have this in the works in 2020, but it just didn't happen. So we're working on it this year for 2022. And what we have in mind is that candidates will see a very clear count of how many QCs they have uh, submitted to us and how many we've determined to be valid. Or if there's some reason that we've found that a qualifying contribution is not valid, uh, you will see a count of that and you can drill down into that and find out why we didn't think it was valid if maybe the contributor is not registered to vote or there's another problem. Um, so we wanna enhance that application and then the last item I wanted to mention uh, is that um, I said earlier, lobbyists register with us and file monthly reports. And all of the information about the lobbyists and their clients is up on the website and available for the public to access. The user interface that the lobbyists use and that the public uses to access that information really could be improved. Um, the current user interface was went live in, I believe, uh, early 2014, and we've never been satisfied with it. We've always had regrets about it. So we are now in the exploration stage of improving that lobbyist disclosure system. So we think it could be a lot easier for the lobbyists to register and file monthly reports or their, for their administrative assistance, uh, but also a lot simpler for legislators and for the public to access, access the information. So, um, you know, at this point, we are probably going to go out to bid for that, even though our current IT company is potentially could provide the services. We want to get the very best product for the very best price. So it's sort of a long term project, but it's going to be one that's going to occupy a lot of time this year. So I wanted to mention that. Great. And director, we have a question if you're yeah. a, Representative Corey. Hey, Jonathan, I just want to say that over the last um, three campaigns or four campaigns of, of me having to do this stuff, it's become easier, you know, every single year. And it's, it's become more intuitive every year, which I think is a huge, um, it says a lot about your office and, and what you've, what you've done for us. So I just don't really want to ask you a question. I just want to say, say thank you for making everything easier. Well, that's really kind of you to say that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the one thing about working with an IT company, is that uh, everything costs money and um, they're outside our control. So I think it's, it's, it's just not always easy to make IT companies. Uh, and I know, Representative Corey, you work in IT, <laughs> IT, so you have a much better breadth of experience than I do on this and, and, and the house chair as well, I think. So, but it's just, it's, it's not always easy when you have software that is customized for your agency uh, and they sell similar software to lots of other states um, and they like to keep things as uniform as possible to say, hey, can you just do this? You know, can it, it just, it, it's a long-term process of improving it. 
And I just want to thank you for your patience because we know it's a lot of work filing these finance reports in addition to everything else you're doing as, as a candidate. So, but thank you for the positive feedback. Director, did you have any more? I don't, Those are, I actually ran through everything I wanted to run through. I wanna thank you for your patience. I'm not used to talking for 15 minutes straight, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's anything else. Great, well, thank you uh, for the presentation, Director Wayne. Uh, any questions from the committee? on the presentation we just heard. Not seeing none, I, I know we've got some bills coming up that you'll be probably before the committee on uh, fair in a couple of weeks. So, oh, we do have a question, Representative Wood. Hi, I, I just had a, a, I don't know if you can comment on the statistics that you included on the main clean elections. You mentioned that this past year it was 55%. And if you look at the history, I mean, it, in the past it was in the high 70s and even 80% of people participated. I, I don't know, is there anything that we've changed in the process that would account for that lowering or it's just people's preference? Um, well, there was a major change in the program and, and I, I, I've rescared, tried to reshare my screen so that you can see the handout that the representative was referring to. Um, there was a, a drop off after the 2010 elections uh, that related to a restructuring of the program and that resulted uh, from a court decision. So Representative Wood, I don't think you intersected with the program at that time, but part of the attraction of the program in its first uh, four to six elections was that it was designed to equalize funding between the candidate who was in the program and their opponent through additional funds called matching funds. And so if, there, if you were say in the program and some outside group made an independent expenditure against you or in the support of your opponent, you as a participant in the program would receive extra funding in order to sort of stay on the okay. same level as your opponent. And that was a really attractive part of the program because it was sort of there to replace traditional campaign contributions. It was instant funding. It, it was something that candidates felt would help them to respond. So there was a significant drop off after 2010. And I, you know, that then we got the, the, the current design of the program through a 2015 citizen initiative, which allows for candidates to not just collect qualifying contributions through April, which was the original design of the program, but to receive to qualify for additional higher levels of funding um, if the candidate wants to by continuing to collect qualifying contributions through the election year into mid October. So the past uh, few elections, we've been paying out these supplemental uh, payments. And uh, I think it's, I, I don't really know where the program is going from here. I think it's, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people don't feel comfortable with it philosophically. It's not how they want to finance their campaigns. They, they know their competing interests in state government, you know, to, to make an understatement. So um, uh, we will, you know, we'll just have to see whether the program, the rate of participation is going to increase. But I think it's sort of in a, re my assessment is it's sort of in a rebuilding phase since the 2015 uh, citizen initiative. And we'll just have to see if it, it's an, a voluntary program. We'll just have to see if more and more candidates are attracted to join or not. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for the director while we have him here? I know after any big election, there's usually a pile of campaign related bills. And I think this year is no different. So you'll probably be in the committee quite a bit, director. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll at the least I'll be submitting written testimony with helpful background information, I hope, you know, one thing about you um, meeting by zoom is I'll never, you know, if I don't really have anything that I really feel like I have to say, I may not join I anyway, I'll just have to work that out. I'm, I, I like to be, especially for work sessions an informational resource, if you have questions, on the other hand, I don't want to intrude if I, you know, if, if one or two paragraphs will do so. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Look forward to working with all of you.
Great. Thank you, Director Wayne, and we'll see you soon. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So next up, we'll have the Department of Public Safety uh, Gambling Control Unit. Looks like we're still kind of getting everybody up uh, and attached to the to the Zoom. So we'll just let's see if we've got Director Champion in there, and uh, and we can. Looks like we're attached. Okay. So we have. Uh, Commissioner Sosjuk here today. If you're ready to go, Commissioner, we can get started on your presentation. Thanks for being in a, a few minutes early and uh, being able to adapt to our schedule. So welcome. No, my, my pleasure, uh, Senator Lucchini. Thank you very much for having us. I uh, truly appreciate the opportunity. It's good to see everybody, uh, even uh, via Zoom here. I I'll apologize in advance. Um, we've got a few of these presentations. So I know some of you heard the legislative briefing book work, <laughs> Senator Farron in particular, uh, and uh, at a meeting yesterday with transportation. And then on Monday, uh, we're gonna have uh, some, some chats with criminal justice, public safety as well, uh, with uh, Senate Chair Deschambeau and others. Um, so uh, I apologize in advance if some of this material you've already seen, uh, but I certainly would uh, be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to, to touch on uh, the Department of Public Safety as a whole. That's not really uh, what you're here to see necessarily. Uh, and then we'll have Director Champion, who you will see and work with on a regular basis. Uh, Milt has a, a brief presentation as well. So again, it's good to see everybody. And I will uh, share a screen and kind of go through our legislative uh, briefing book that I know we did uh, share with everybody that's uh, on all of the committees that, uh, that um, we interact with on a regular basis. And uh, we put a lot of work into this, and uh, I hope you keep it handy. Uh, and I think if nothing else, you know, the pictures, putting faces to names and things of that nature uh, can be helpful for folks. Uh, you can certainly always reach out to me or through Milt or whoever you think is most appropriate, and we'll get right back to you no matter what the question happens to be. But I did want to kind of roll through this as a, uh, as a benchmark for us to kind of work from. Uh, so just straight up, very simple for us, uh, table of contents kind of uh, information, you know, for us overall, 625 positions, uh, about $133 million budget, that 22-23 proposed budget is, uh, is just here in this uh, basic pie chart. Uh, the brains of the operation, Kendra Coates, uh, whose picture I will show momentarily, uh, she's our assistant to the commissioner, which uh, at DPS, is the terminology we use, which you may hear as a deputy commissioner in many other departments. That's just terminology for us. Uh, but Kendra's amazing, uh, very strong financial background. And uh, we'll be moving this budget through our, our regular committee process here as well over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so there's some basic information there. We have a total of 10 different uh, bureaus to include an administrative bureau or the commissioner's shop. Uh, and I'll touch on those momentarily. but. This mission, vision, values, uh, you know, I think it's incredibly important to us to always have a benchmark to come back to uh, as an agency. Uh, as I said yesterday in the presentation, and I'll say repeatedly, uh, to me, the best organizations on the planet aren't ones uh, where those values, that mission, those, uh, that vision is just on the side of a car or a letterhead. It's so you really live, uh, you live and die based on, on those values and the way you operate uh, day in and day out. And I think we've got a, a great shop here at DPS, something that I'm, uh, I'm very, very proud of. These statutes, you know, this isn't for everybody, but we included them because some people may want to, to dive in and see where uh, some of this authority comes from uh, for these different bureaus. They may want to get specific. Uh, others may want to just come to subject matter experts and ask them direct questions. And we're certainly happy either way, uh, but this information is included uh, for that backdrop. Bunch of other stuff here that uh, has an impact on uh, the subjects that we cover, but not necessarily the, the basic infrastructure or authority with, with, uh, within which we operate. So this is just some basic bio information on me and then on Kendra, who I had just mentioned uh, with her decades of experience with the state. Uh, and then uh, the reason I want Danielle in here as the executive assistant or whatever terminology we call that with the state, uh, you know, because we all know uh, any operation is run uh, by folks like Danielle. You know, somebody's calling, they're leaving a message, they're trying to set up an appointment uh, or a meeting. Uh, Danielle is really the, the nerve center of that. 
uh, for DPS. Uh, so you're going to have contact with her at some point along the way. And then Chris Parr is our long-term uh, Maine State Police Attorney, Legislative Coordinator Liaison. Uh, Chris is uh, a big piece of the internal operations around legislative sessions and tracking bills and summaries and when we're submitting testimony. And uh, we just started our legislative in-house meetings uh, just this last Monday. Uh, and those will continue on a weekly basis as we work up into the full 130 session. Uh, Capitol Police, obviously this has been in the media quite a bit uh, with Chief Govan. Um, just to address the elephant in the room, it's not a situation I can talk about publicly because it is a personnel matter, uh, but we do take it very seriously. We are uh, looking into this like we would any other situation involving personnel issues. Uh, so that is ongoing. Uh, as it currently stands, Lieutenant Bob Elliott a long-term member of the Capitol Police is currently leading uh, the Capitol Police agency, uh, but I am more heavily involved with that uh, as well. And then we'll just hit on the rest of these bureaus as we go. Uh, consolidated emergency communications, you know, the reality is that we have a lot of these first responders, boots on the ground, actively responding to emergencies, uh, but the reality is they come back to dispatch, who is a lifeline for us, and that would be Brody Shop, uh, and there are three regional communication centers uh, based in Holton, Bangor, uh, and right here at a 40, uh, 45 Commerce Drive in, in Augusta. Bureau of Emergency uh, Medical Services, EMS, uh, Sam Hurley as a director there, they are intimately involved every day, all day with the state's COVID response. And uh, Director Hurley has been with us a little over a year now. Uh, he actually came up from uh, EMS out of DC, an amazing addition. Uh, with a very, very uh, strong background in epidemiology, as it so happens. Uh, and it's great to have our internal uh, experts uh, that we can lean on, uh, as well as our, our partners over at CDC. So Sam's been a great addition. Fire Marshal's office with Joe Thomas. Uh, this has really got two arms. Uh, there's the life safety inspection uh, side of the house under Rich McCarthy. Uh, and then we have, a, obviously, a, an investigative arm for arson investigations under Lieutenant Troy Gardner. Uh, and Troy is relatively new with us, been there a few months. Uh, that was a position that uh, we got through the budget uh, last year and it filled and it's been a, an amazing addition. It was our number one priority and we appreciated the support through the legislature to get that position uh, filled. Gambling control, uh, some of you may know this guy. Uh, he's gonna be popping back up here in just a second. Uh, Bureau of Highway Safety with Director Lauren Stewart. Uh, she's got a national uh, platform uh, and does a lot of work uh, nationally with the groups that are that are most important partnering with these issues uh, and a long-term again employee i, I kind of walked into a shop where a lot of our directors have a, a solid tenure they've been around a while uh, and that's been great and uh, lauren is an amazing subject matter expert on that category uh, Rick Disjardin's here. Uh, some of you may remember John Rogers as the director. John retired uh, last year uh, and Rick has been uh, great. He was his deputy for a long time. Uh, and uh, just like all of our worlds, private and professional, uh, the Maine Criminal Justice Academy has certainly had to adapt uh, to COVID and everything that that means. Um, and uh, Rick is leading that charge and doing a great job there. Uh, Roy McKinney is the director of Maine Drug Enforcement. Uh, Roy's been with us about 20 years in that role. Uh, I actually worked for Roy as, a, as an agent at one point and then a uh, task force supervisor for one point. Uh, just blessed to have him in, uh, in, in the shop here. Uh, and then Colonel Cody uh, and his entire team uh, with the Maine State Police and his command staff. Uh, of our 625 employees, about 448 of them our main state uh, police employees, about 330 sworn officers, so law enforcement officers, and then 118 civilian staff as well. Uh, all a very integral piece of this. It's not, uh, I don't care if you're sworn or civilian, it does not matter to me. Uh, we are a DPS family, uh, and the main state police have been uh, amazing to, to work with. They, they truly have. This legislative oversight, these are the committees that we generally work for and work with. Uh, criminal justice, public safety, uh, certainly uh, judiciary, transportation, VLA. Uh, we do find ourselves in front of health and human services on a regular basis, which truth be told, I'm proud of. That means I think we're doing it right. Uh, it's not just an enforcement driven bureau uh, and departments. Uh, we do uh, obviously have a strong 
impact on the health and human services side of the house. Bunch of boards and commissions uh, that we're uh, involved with on a regular basis. We do have uh, six bills, department bills that we submitted uh, and Milt can touch on, uh, on one of these that is directly impacted uh, by VLA and by the gambling control uh, unit. Uh, and that is this last one here, an act to change the renewal issuance time from six months to 60 days. Uh, and there's a solid reasoning uh, behind that. And then ongoing initiatives and emerging challenges. I'm not gonna go into these categories uh, today. Uh, we got about 30 minutes and I wanna roll this over to, to Milt. Uh, that's the most important piece. Uh, but again, I would be remiss if I didn't take some opportunity to introduce you to uh, the department overall and just let you know that I'm, I'm very proud of the work that they do. And uh, we're lucky to have a, a very professional team uh, driving hard every day on behalf of the state of Maine. So uh, I obviously not my meeting. I'm happy to do whatever works for you, sir. Uh, but I'm going to stop sharing here and uh, turn it over to a director a champion, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Thanks, Commissioner. And welcome, yeah. Director Champion. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I guess it's still, yeah, it's still morning. We're all good. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Lucini, uh, Representative Siazzo, uh, and distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I am Milton Champion, Executive Director of the Gaming Control Unit. I am here today to give you a briefing on the organization and the responsibilities of the Gambling Control Board and the Gambling Control Unit. Uh, the State of Maine Gambling Control Board and Unit was established in 2004 in response to Citizens' Initiative to allow slot machines in Bangor, Maine. Uh, in November 2005, Hollywood uh, Casino opened with slot machines only. In November 2010, the citizens of Maine voted to allow a second casino in Oxford County. Oxford Casino began operations as a full casino with both slots and table games in June of 2012. In November of 2011, after local approval allowed for them to add table games, Hollywood Casino began operating a full casino in March of 2012. The Gambling Control Board itself is made up of five members appointed by the governor who meet once a month uh, in order to mo monitor this, the oversight of gambling at casinos in Maine. As the executive director, I report to that Gambling Control Board and provide leadership, administration, and oversight of three functional areas. These areas include licensing, auditing, and inspections. Each area focuses on a different aspect of regulation with the gaming industry. Specific responsibilities include, but are not limited to staff development, budget planning, rule proclamation, revenue distribution, individual business licensing, and enforcement of main statutes and board rules through each facility system of internal controls. The organizational chart that I've attached to my presentation today identifies each position and in some cases, the current number of staffing for particular positions. The executive director is responsible, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the executive director is responsible for directing the day-to-day -day operations of the gambling control unit. Some of the functions and responsibilities in include but are not limited to processing an average of 750 casino employees new or renewal licenses, distributing weekly collected funds from casino activity to various state departments and accounts, totaling $58.5 million in 2019. On-site inspectors of observations or formal written inspections of casino operations, according to main statute board rules or facility internal controls and conducting background investigations of all business entity and individual licenses. In addition, there are two assistant attorney generals assigned as legal counsel to the board and the unit and the, a the AAGs attend meetings for the board, uh, administrative hearings and work closely with the executive director on legal matters that arise. An employee at the State Bureau of Investigation or Identification is funded by the Gambling Control Board budget due to the additional work imposed by fingerprint background checks. According to May Revised Statute Title VIII, Chapter 31, Scientific Games was selected as a third party to operate the central site monitoring system so that all slot machines in the state of Maine communicate electronically with that system. 
attached. You also see in the in the uh, presentation the Gambling Control Board actual expenses for the last two calendar years, 2018 and 2019, with the largest expense being the contract with Scientific Games to meet the requirements as previously stated. Also uh, are the revenues collected uh, by the casinos for the last two calendar years. In March, uh, or by March 15th, 2021, you will be receiving the board's annual report, which will outline the allocation of funds distributed under Maine Revised Statute, Title VIII, Chapter 31, that totaled th roughly $30 million unaudited for 2020. That was a decrease of 49% versus 2019 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. An act to authorize advanced deposit wagering for horse racing began or became law September 20th, 2016. After being ratified by the leg legislature and approved by the governor the Gambling Control Board, approved final rules for adoption on June 23rd, 2018. A request for proposal was issued for one awardee for an advanced deposit uh, wagering operator by statute. The award was issued to Hollywood Races LLC on May 19th, 2020. Collective fees have decreased each month since June 2020, except for November, with the total funds collected for 2020 of $156,000. Outside of the oversight of the Gambling Control Board in 2017, regulatory oversight of non or nonprofit charitable gaming of eligible organization, organizations was transferred from Maine State Police to the Gambling Control Unit. In 2020, the unit processed 3,449 license and or registrations of games of chance, bingo or bingo, and collected fees of $323,000. Um, that was a 36% decrease from licenses and or registrations uh, processed, uh, processed and 32% decrease in collected funds from 2019 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also in 2017, regulatory oversight of fantasy contests were assigned to the executive director position within the gambling control unit. Rulemaking was recently completed and those provisionally adopted rules will be presented to you this session for confirmation and ultimately final adoption as they are the initial rules, which are major substantive according to statute. 11 operators have applied for licenses and are operating in Maine pending license approval by statute. Uh, we've identified two that have disclosed gross revenues over 100,000 and as such will pay the 10% fee to the general fund. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Director Champion for that presentation, for being here today. Uh, Representative McCrate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, hi, Director. I just lost you right at the end. This, you, you have a lot on your plate. But the, the very last part that you're, bring, you're going to be bringing forward, I lost track of, of the specifics of what that's about. Could you just recap? Okay, that's, that would be on the fantasy contest rules. And I apologize if, if you hear some tweaking going, I'm not breaking out a guitar and I'm not going to sing for you today, but the, the, uh, my computer's acting up. I, I'm uh, trying to pull some, pull some information up and it just everything's in slow motion today. So if, if, you, if we have some problems, I apologize. No, it was just me in slow motion. You were fine. <laughs> no, uh, the fantasy sports uh, was, was uh, given to the executive director position in 2017. Uh, it, it was actually, it went into law without, this, without the governor's signature at the time. And uh, since then, we've been, we actually went through two or three uh, uh, publishings of rules as a result of the comments and responses that, that we were having. And so, um, so we were able to finalize those. And because they're major substantive according to statute, they have to come back to you, to the VLA committee for final confirmation. So uh, they they were submitted, 
and and I believe uh, February first, we're actually having a public hearing on that on those uh, on those rules. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I think we'll have both the rules and uh, your department bill that day. Um, Director, on the ADW, I don't know if you know it's off the top of your head, uh, but on that um, award for the RFP, do you know the length of that, of the contract? I think we, we may have lost Director Champion. <laughs> uh, we're just coming back on now. There he is. I, I, yeah, I don't know what's, I don't know what's going on this morning, but it happens. I, I live near a school, so sometimes the bandwidth is bad. Um, I think it's too many people working during the day. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, sir. Yeah, uh, I was just going to ask, um, and I don't know if you have it on you, but um, what is the length of the, the contract that was awarded for advanced deposit wagering? Advanced deposit wagering, uh, I believe it was five, so it would be like a two, two, and one. Uh, so it's it's over two years initial initial two years. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions for uh, Public Safety Gambling Control Unit? All right, seeing none. Thanks to everybody for coming in today. Thank you, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, and Director, uh, for being here today. Um, and we'll see you in about a week and a half with some bills. So. Thank you very much for having us. Have a, have a good weekend. Great. Have a nice one. Thank you. So with, I think that's going to conclude our uh, morning agenda. Janet, is there anything that we need to add before we break? Not that I'm aware of, um, just to make sure everybody comes back at one, it will be the same Zoom link that you use to log in this morning, but logging out now ensures that you're not broadcasting to the world your lunchtime conversations, or we're not watching and seeing what you eat and either being jealous or um, any other reaction we might have. So I hope we see you at one. Great, thanks, Janet. Yeah, that's a good point um, because the stream will be going nonstop all the way through the way that the YouTube system works. Um, but our, I believe Karen's stream will stay on nonstop. Uh, so it's probably safest just to detach and then come back on. Uh, we, looks like we do have one question from uh, Senator DeChambeau. Um, not a question just to tell you, I'm sorry, but this afternoon at the same time I have a clack meeting and that all has to do with criminal justice so I have to hop on to that one so thank you very much great meeting all of you um, we'll probably see each other in the hallways when we get back more than I'll, you'll see me in that room but I will follow up and uh, this looks like a great crowd um, so my son will keep talking to me about betting online on football games. I know that's what's going to happen. So thank you. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Senator. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough when you have multiple committees and I'm sure everybody's going to be really busy and, and popping in and out. It's not that they don't want to be here, but they have a lot of other things and sponsoring other bills and everything else. And Senator, this will be recorded so you can watch it tonight while you eat dinner. So any other questions before we uh, recess? All right, seeing none, we'll uh, come back at uh, one o'clock. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Lou.
Senator, you look like a busy guy. Always just working on some of these features. <laughs> well, I was talking to Matt Harrington, telling him that uh, the city Senator, of Sanford. Or Rep Representative, just so you know, it is on live stream too. Well, it's okay. People okay. know me. Yep. But I, I was saying the people of Sanford are very well represented on the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. So we should all be happy about that. That's right. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Oh. How's Lydia?
hey Sam, you get you get me in transportation and VLA. I know I just couldn't get enough of you. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll go with that. <laughs> Ooh. Right, so I think we've got a bunch of members back. It's a little after one o'clock. So uh, I think we can reconvene the committee on veterans and legal affairs. <coughs> so this afternoon, um, after, after doing all those briefings this morning, this afternoon, we've got a committee staff orientation um, and that'll be led by a few different of our uh, nonpartisan offices. Um, we, we got a little bit of a briefing from Janet this morning, but we can uh, turn it over to Janet and, and Sam, who's our, our other analyst for this session. Um, and they can kind of brief us on what OPLA does for the committee. So. If you're both ready, you can take it over. Just a, a quick introduction. Again, my name is Janet Stoko. This is my sixth year working with the legislature at the Office of Policy and Legal Analysis, which we call OPLA affectionately. I've staffed this committee, the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee in the 129th legislature, so for two years. And prior to that, I worked with the Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development Committee, which we called LCRED, which is not all that interesting of a name, but that's what it was. And also I worked for a few years on the Judiciary Committee. I am a licensed main attorney and the counsel for the committee. So if you have any legal questions that arise during the course of committee work, I'm happy to try and help answer them for you. Um, my co-staff this year is Sam Prower and I, I wanna let him introduce himself. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, uh, I'm Sam Prower. Um, I've, this is my third year um, as an analyst for uh, OPLA. Um, I usually work with the Transportation Committee, although I've um, popped up in criminal justice and uh, EUT at times. Um, I don't know <laughs> what else I should tell you for my intro, um, but I, you'll, you'll see me for a handful of bills uh, this session and here to help out Janet and any, any with anything else the community might need. Great. Thanks, Sam. And at the moment, although all of these things are subject to the bill load and what bills actually are referred to the committee, at the moment, if you have questions relating to marijuana bills and veterans department bills, you can refer those to Sam or you can just copy both of us on all of the emails and we'll just sort out who's the one who's supposed to answer your question. Don't feel like you have to memorize which bill we belong to. We can take care of that for you. Um, I did go through a lot of navigating the web page, but I just wanted to remind you of a few things really quickly. I hope it's not too um, repetitive for you. So I tried to put everything on the right screen since I do have two monitors so that I wouldn't be transferring screens. So hopefully this works a little more smoothly, but if not, do feel free to interrupt and let me know you can't see something. We can Again, see it so far, yeah. Okay, thank you. Again, on the home page, the top left, you can find um, all the list of bills. In the middle here, you can click to the committee page. Remember best for last. So Veterans and Legal Affairs is on the bottom. At the very top, you can show your constituents or if you just want to watch, you can watch any committee. If you go to their committee's page YouTube stream just by clicking YouTube. Um, if you have people you know who want to submit testimony on any of the bills that have been advertised for a public hearing, you can direct them here to testimony submission on the VLA page or there's also a button right on the home page of the legislature's website. They can find it in many places throughout the legislature's website. Um, the live audio again is in the middle of the page. That'll start working again next week once we have um, a little bit more LIT staff support because they've been very busy and they have some um, offsite issues this week. And then also the committee materials page, which I'd shown you earlier. 
I wanted you to know that on this page, as we move forward, I'm gonna try and zoom it in a little bit. When we have um, public hearings and work sessions, um, you can find information for each LD that'll be under this first tab, which is committee materials by LD. We don't have any yet, so there, you're not gonna find anything there now, but there will be in the future. Um, the orientation materials I showed you already are all posted here. Um, the briefings for next week will start appearing there later today. There are supplemental budget materials, as Representative Kayazo said, Earlier this morning, we are going to have a joint public hearing with the AFA committee next week on Thursday in the afternoon on the supplemental budget. So if you want to review the portions of that supplemental budget that are within the, within the jurisdiction of this committee, they're linked here and you can just look at those at your leisure. Um, we also have a link here called policies governing committee work. So the Legislative Council's COVID-19 prevention policy is linked here as well as the letter from the presiding officers earlier this month that sort of expands upon the COVID prevention policy and gives a little bit more information on precisely how it works if you're going to appear in the committee room, whether you need a mask and et cetera and so forth. Um, we also do, as we did last year, although I don't know how clearly I conveyed this to the committee, we do post all the reports received by the committee here. Um, so I know that Secretary of State Bellows mentioned that her office submitted a report to the committee on the central voter registration system and that report is posted here. So what will happen is I'll send it to you electronically when I receive it and then I'll ask the people in our office who are responsible for posting to make sure it is posted here. So that's where you can find things in the future. Last year, we didn't really use these committee material pages very much. This is new because of our remote environment but all of the reports received during the 129th legislature are posted. And so you can find those if you wanna find a report from the past, it'll be posted here and we'll be maintaining these going forward. Anything prior to the 129th legislature, we can get our hands on it, but the quickest way is for you to contact the law library. They do keep all the reports. If you want more information, I'm gonna go back to the homepage on, um, how to find different things on the website. Next Monday, we have a committee meeting and after the um, briefings that we have then, I'm going to be providing um, what I call how to read a bill presentation. Basically, it's just orientation to how the legislature presents things in documents and what do all the initials mean and where do you find everything? And if it says on a bill, this is repealed, how do you find what actually was repealed because it's not gonna be printed on the bill and you might not know what that means. All of those sorts of questions, um, the role of analysts during each stage of the process, we can go over all of that, but that's um, something that's more optional for people who want more in-depth information. What I'm gonna tell you now is the stuff I have to tell everyone, make sure that you know. So the first thing, what is OPLA? What is that acronym I just threw out at you? So Sam and I work for OPLA, which is a nonpartisan staff office within the main legislature. We work under the auspices of the Legislative Council. We are nonpartisan. That is the most important thing you need to remember about us, which means that we are prohibited from taking or advocating political positions on policy issues or engaging in any activities that might be construed as partisan or political. We take this duty very seriously and we try to avoid even the appearance of partisanship. So we work for all of you, everyone on this screen and then the people who couldn't be here today for our committee meeting. We don't care what party you are, whether you're in a party or not. Um, it, it doesn't matter, but I'm not enrolled in a party in case you were wondering, and I haven't been ever. Um, I have relatives who are Republicans and Democrats and independents and Greens and all sorts of different things. And it doesn't matter what they think, I'm nonpartisan, I work for all of you. Um, as far as what that means to us, it goes beyond even not enrolling in parties. We're not allowed to engage in any party activities. We can't contribute to campaigns. So please don't ask us if we say no, it's not because we don't like you. Um, we don't have political bumper stickers on our cars, lawn signs, anything else like that. Um, we can't sign nomination petitions. So if you're from my district, I'm sorry, I can't sign to help your nomination and we can't sign any citizens initiatives. So that makes it easy for us when we go to vote, we just walk right past all of those people in the voting place. We literally are not allowed, it's in our policies. 
Um, our office staffs all of the joint standing committees of the legislature with two exceptions, the Office of Fiscal and Program Review staffs the AFA committee and the tax committee, but the rest of the legislative analysts you will meet do work for OPLA. The staff services we provide to the committee include providing nonpartisan policy and legal research and analysis of legislation and issues that come before the committee, and we assist your, you with your consideration of legislation. We draft all committee papers, but that sounds odd. What is a committee paper? Well, that would include any amendments that the committee votes for, majority or minority amendments, all of them. We draft all committee bills. So if this committee votes to report out a bill to the full legislature, we would draft that. We re and we also draft all letters. So sometimes when a vote is taken, you might say, well, we don't wanna pass this bill, but we think it's a very important issue. Can you please draft a letter on behalf of the committee that tells the agency to look into this issue and maybe report back to us with some ideas on how to solve it the next legislature? We draft all of those letters as well. We also help individual legislators with drafting and information requests. And this is actually something that's going to be a little difficult for us in this remote world. What would happen ordinarily if we were in a meeting in the committee room, I might notice that someone is looking a little bit puzzled at what I'm saying. I do have a tendency to talk a little too fast and I do make charts that are awfully complicated that some people complain about that I hand out to people or that I'll post online for you to see on that committee materials page. And I might notice that perhaps someone isn't following along because I've been confusing and I would approach you ordinarily in our in-person world after and I'd say, look, I realize I was just being confusing. Can you please let me know if there's any way I can help? Well, I can't approach you now because we're all in different locations. So please don't hesitate to email. I also might not notice the puzzled look on your face because I'm looking at the Hollywood squares like the rest of you and I can't see everyone at once. So please, please, if I get nothing else across to you, please don't hesitate to email Sam and me. We'll be happy to help. If you've gotten the wrong one of us, we'll just send the email on to the other one. Um, in the interim, so in between sessions, some people think we're doing nothing, but it's not actually true. We do staff interim study commissions. Um, we work with the commission chairs to help schedule everything, just like during the committee um, process, we do help the chairs with all of the scheduling. I do want you to know, however, we assist the chairs with scheduling. We are not responsible for the scheduling. So if you don't like the schedule, you need to complain to the chairs, not to me. Um, <laughs> we also do conduct staff studies during the legislative interim when we've been directed to do so. We help the revisor's office in drafting all the bills. So as you can imagine, if you look at those lists of bills that I showed you that you can get to from the legislature's website, there are many, many, many bills submitted, over 1,500, I can't remember the exact number. It's not possible for the few attorneys and paralegals in the revisor's office to draft those all at the drop of a hat. So we try and help. We draft about 20% of them, but it's amazing how they can, with a much smaller staff of attorneys and um, bill drafters than we have, they draft 80% of them and they just amaze me. Um, we also prepare, prepare and present reports to legislative leadership. That is as an office on the status of committee work on bills. I don't personally do that. Sam doesn't personally do that. Our director and deputy director do that. Um, so sometimes we're asked, um, what is it that you do that I don't really know about? Like, is there something that I could be asking you for help on that maybe I never even occurred to me? So I did wanna let you know that we are sometimes tasked to work with interested parties to help identify agreements or disagreements in, on different topics for example, there was a bill that the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee considered in the 129th legislature that had to do with a very complicated statute that outlines the um, contractual agreements that can be entered between um, distilleries and wineries and the wholesale licensees who distribute their products throughout the state for sale to retailers. And it's a very complicated statute and it was a very complicated issue. The bill that was before the committee only addressed beer, which we don't call beer when we're writing statutes, we call it malt liquor because we like to be confusing. Um, so the bill was about malt liquor and distilleries, but their hard cider, as many of you may know, 
is very similar to beer, but it's actually made by wineries, not distilleries. So there were a lot of people, it was a complicated issue. And rather than spend hours and hours and hours going over every single word in front of the committee, the committee tasked me with working with the stakeholders and meeting with the representatives from the wholesalers and the breweries and the wineries and working through and making sure all of them had input on the final product came back to the committee at a subsequent work session, presented what they felt they all could agree to. Nobody was 100% happy, but they all could live with it. And that helped save the committee a lot of time. And it gave the committee reassurance that the stakeholders knew precisely what was in the language of that amendment. Nobody had to vote for it, but it was just something that um, the committee asked me to do. And so we brought it back to them. We can also um, summarize policy options and questions in an organized fashion. An example. Um, of that might be there were several bills involving sports betting before the VLA committee in the 129th. And rather than go in detail line by line through each bill, um, I put together a chart which just addressed each topic and showed the committee how each bill that different sponsors had presented addressed each topic. And then the committee was able to say, okay, on topic one, we're going with Bill X and their approach. On topic two, we're going with Bill Y. On topic three, we're going back to Bill X and they were able to select it. And hopefully it made the process faster, but if it didn't, don't embarrass me by telling everybody right now. Um, we also do conduct the research during the interim on issues of importance to the committee. My favorite topic, and we will be talking about it again this session, is um, our office was tasked with reading the entire liquor laws, so the entire Title 28A of the main revised statutes, identifying every inconsistency, ambiguity, or conflict in the law that we could find as we read through that. So we put together a huge chart and presented it to the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. And um, then they appointed the subcommittee and we worked through all of that. And you will be seeing a lengthy but absolutely delightful bill going through all of the decisions that that subcommittee made on how to maybe clarify and clean up some of those inconsistencies and conflicts. You don't have to vote for the bill. I just think it's delightful because it was the result of a lot of work. Even if you don't like the bill, it is very delightful. You should agree and just how beautifully it's drafted. Um, it's like a 120 pages of <laughs> cleanup. <laughs> it was quite a long uh, two year process of subcommittee fixing up a lot of things, but. It'll come back this year, so. <laughs> and, and like I said, um, this is just an example for you. These are the kind of things you may not have thought that legislative analysts can do, but we can. Um, if it's going to be a product project during the interim, we do need to be directed to. So there was a resolve passed and um, then the Veterans Legal Affairs Committee at that time met and gave some direction to OPLA staff about exactly what would be helpful to them. Then another question we are sometimes asked is, is there something you shouldn't ask an OPLA analyst to do? And basically you shouldn't worry about that. If, if you have a question and you wanna ask us and it's really something we can't do, we'll tell you that. It may be something that strays over into the partisan side of where we view nonpartisanship. So for example, if you're going to give a floor speech, we can't write that for you. We can't give you talking points for it, but you could ask us to remind you um, which people testified or where that you can find that testimony so that you can draw on those resources for when you draft your floor speech. If it's a question that we have no idea how to answer, we may in fact be able to find the person who could answer it. So sometimes a complicated election law question, you could ask me, I might know the answer. If not, I will either direct you to speak to someone in the Secretary of State's office or I'll do that for you and then get back to you with the answer to the question. Um, Ordinarily, you can find us in the cross office building, um, and sometimes we are there, but largely we are now working remotely like most of the world is during the pandemic. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much, however. You can still email us, and we're always checking our email. You can give us a call right on our um, phone number, which is going to appear at the top of the OPLA page on that orientation materials website that I showed you. And our secretaries are in the office all all day during business days and they're answering the phones and we check our voicemails regularly even when we're working remotely. So don't worry that we aren't gonna see your message for a whole week because we happen to be working from home. We will get your message and we'll respond as soon as we can. 
Um, currently, our office is closed to visitors, so you can't stop by and visit, but we can't wait for the day when you can again, because it is really nice to meet you in person. So then that's the number one topic I wanted to get across to you was who we are and the nonpartisan nature of our work. Another very important topic that is crucial for everyone to hear about is the main Freedom of Access Act and confidentiality. Again, I'll remind you several times, I hope I remember to remind you that there are handouts on all of these topics on that orientation materials website, but I didn't wanna go word through, for word through all of them. So I'll just give you the highlights. The most important thing to remember about the Freedom of Access Act is it's a law passed by the legislature, that's you all, and the intent of the legislature stated directly in the act is that actions involving the conduct of the people's business should be taken, taken openly and the records of their actions should be open to the public inspection and their delib deliberations should be conducted openly. For this reason, all public proceedings, which is a term that is defined in the statute, have to be preceded with public notice. So we give notice of all public hearings. We've given notice of today's meeting and the public must be allowed to attend them. Ordinarily, that would mean um, attend or observe. And ordinarily, that would mean that the committee room is open and there are seats for the public to come and watch the committee's proceedings. During this remote environment, the way we are allowing the public access to observe the meetings is all of them are being broadcast on YouTube and they're recorded. And in addition, the audio is being sent out for people who don't want to watch the whole stream, but just want to listen to it. Um, all of the legislature's committee meetings are considered public proceedings and in addition, subcommittee meetings. And I did want to touch on this very briefly because a great question was posed to me the other day and I wanted to give you a little bit of reassurance. So what is a legislative subcommittee? It is a group of three or more committee members appointed for the purpose of conducting legislative business on behalf of the committee. So in the future, when we're all back in the state house complex, if you happen to go down to the cafe, to eat lunch and you sit down at a table that happens to have two other members of this Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee, you are there to eat lunch. You haven't been appointed by this committee to conduct the committee's business. So you don't have to worry that you're violating the Freedom of Access Act by sitting there and talking to each other. And the Freedom of Access Act does specifically say that it does not prohibit communications outside of public proceedings unless those communications are used to defeat the purposes of FOA. So if you actually were appointed all as a subcommittee and you end up meeting in the cafe and conducting all of your subcommittee meetings there, then you have a problem. But if you're really just eating lunch, don't worry about it, you're fine. So Janet, um, um, I believe Representative Tuttle has a question. Yes, sir. Oh, uh uh, it's for the chairman. I have to go pick up my grandson at school. So I would hope that I could get permission to leave the meeting to do that, Mr. Chair. Chair, sure. you're all set, Representative Tuttle. All right. Good to well, see I've you been, as always. I've, I've enjoyed our first meeting. I'm sure it won't be our last, will we? Right. And you, you, you're pretty experienced with this stuff, so. Yeah. Yep. Well. All right. Have a good one. Let's hope so, Louis, but uh, I'm saying goodbye right now, but I'll see you guys next week. <clears throat> okay. nice, to, nice to meet you. All right, nice to meet you. Um, as far as public access to public proceedings, um, because of the need for the public to have notice and the opportunity to observe the proceedings, that's why it's been recommended that you not use the Zoom chat feature for substantive discussions because that is not being broadcast out on YouTube or recorded for posterity. So it really shouldn't be used to avoid the public access to legislative committee meetings. In addition, if um, Karen or I or Sam or someone else sends out some kind of scheduling email, everyone perhaps saying we're gonna have a work session on this bill next week and here are some um, handouts that are being posted on the web right now that we'll be discussing. Um, don't hit reply all and start talking to each other about how you do or don't like that particular proposal in that LD because then you are engaging in a committee meeting over email without public access or notice. So those are some um, recommendations to make sure we're being um, true to the spirit of the Freedom of Access Act. 
In addition, under that act, public records must be publicly accessible. And that term, public records, is defined also very broadly in a way that would include most, if not all, papers and electronic records relating to legislative business. And that includes emails that um, we send to you about legislative business. And the reason I mention that is you may notice that you might say to Sam or to myself, please, can you just use my personal email? I check that all the time. I don't get my legislative email and look at it very regularly. The, the inbox is flooded with a million different emails. So can you please use my personal email? We might put your personal email in the, in the two line of our message to you, but we are always going to copy your legislative email. And in that way, if you ever get a Freedom of Access Act request for certain records, the LIT department can help you search through that and you won't have to turn over your phone or your personal computer to get at your personal emails because you'll be assured that we have copied all of our emails to you using your legislative email. Despite all of this per, um, public access to public records, there is an exception built right into that law that talks about the working papers of the legislature and those are confidential during the session. So I do wanna reassure you that a lot of um, your interactions with Sam and with myself that are outside of an actual co committee meeting are confidential and we are governed by strict confidentiality policies just as we are governed by strict nonpartisan policies. So um, not only do we work in the public realm, but we also help legislators behind the scenes with their requests for information, for research, for drafting uh, bills. If we're assigned to draft your bill, we're working with you in a confidential matter. We're not going around and saying, hey, friends, did you know that Representative Zupika's bill is going to do X? I would never do that. I'm actually not assigned to draft any of her bills, but even if I were, I wouldn't do that. Um, we're not allowed to. If you have an idea for a proposed amendment, if Representative Corey says to me, Janet, I'm thinking of proposing an amendment to this LD, can you prepare this for the work ses session? I'm not going to tell anyone that he made that request. Even if Senator Farron comes up to me the same day or emails me the same day and asks for exactly the same amendment, I'm not gonna say, oh, don't worry about it. Representative Corey already asked me for that amendment. So you may think, we're going to a work session and now we have two identical amendments and Janet's name is on both of them. Wasn't she smart enough to realize they're identical? Well, hopefully I was smart enough. I sincerely hope so. But even if I was, I'm not allowed to repeal, reveal to either of you that that was the same idea the other one had. And for that, and the reason for that is also very important because when we get to that work session, um, Representative Corey and Senator Farron may be listening to the discussion and all of a sudden they don't like their idea for a proposed amendment anymore. And if I've gone and blabbed to the other one that that was also their idea and then they say, well, Representative Corey, you never did propose your amendment, but I know you agreed with me and now you're voting against me and they'll get really upset. Well, I'm supposed to keep all of that confidential and so I will and I'm not gonna display the amendment that they requested. They get the chance to decide whether they want to presented to the public at the meeting or not. So those are the reasons for that kind of confidentiality. Senator Lucchini sometimes refers to me as his priest. It's not exactly true, but I can see the analogy. Representative Corey, did you have a question? Sorry. No, I just appreciated that she wasn't gonna rat me out <laughs> with my amendment. So thank you, Janet. <laughs> I try not, I, I don't want you and Senator Farron to get at it either. So I'd, I'd have to separate you guys. Appreciate Senator that, Farron? Mr. Chair. And just for the record, it would be Representative Corey that would be copying my amendment, not the other way around, just so we're clear on that. I must have that's, misspoken. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, some other things for you to know, um, the, the working papers exception to the public records, um, provision and then our confidentiality policies provide that legislative papers, those are the bill drafts that I gave an example of a committee amendment, even a voted committee amendment and the like are not public until signed and publicly distributed. So for example, if we're at a work session and um, a majority of the committee amend votes to make an amendment to the bill and maybe a minority votes ought not to pass, Sam or I will go off, we'll start working on drafting that amendment and inevitably 
a lobbyist or someone else will email us and say, can I see that amendment? I see you're gonna bring it back to the committee for a language review. I'd just like to see it. Or maybe the bill sponsor isn't a member of our committee, but wants to see a copy of that amendment because they can't be at the committee meeting on the day and time when it's going to be presented. Our answer is going to be no. We are not allowed to reveal that text of that amendment until it's been publicly presented to the committee. And so we'll wait until we come before you. This does cause some complications sometimes, however. For example, um, there was a bill involving elections that came before VLA in the last session, and it touched on some um, language about withdrawal of candidates. And I was reading through those statutes and I was terribly confused and I couldn't figure out up or down from how they were drafted. So I asked the committee at the work session, can I please have permission while I'm drafting this amendment to speak with Deputy Secretary of State Flynn and have her help explain those um, sections of law to me and maybe bounce off or send her drafts of the committee amendment to her to make sure that I'm not messing up the law or doing something that I don't understand because I wasn't familiar with those statutes. If I have that permission, or if Sam has that permission, we will be able to share those drafts, but otherwise we won't. So you might think it's ridiculous when we're at a work session and we say, can I please share this draft? And you say, of course, obviously you have to, but we actually have to ask you or we don't have permission to do that. So that's why we're doing that. Um, another thing is that the fiscal office, and they're gonna speak very shortly, you'll, you'll be able to stop listening to me for a moment. Um, they also aren't allowed to share drafts with anyone before an amendment has been publicly presented to the committee. And this can be a little bit complicated because they need to then prepare a fiscal analysis and a fiscal note for that committee amendment. So often at the beginning of the session at our first work sessions, um, Sam or I, we might ask you, can we blanket have permission to, to share the text of any committee amendment um, with, well, we can share it with the fiscal office because they're internal, but can we get permission for the fiscal office to then share it with departments or agencies who provide fiscal information to you so that you can have a full understanding and a fiscal note prepared? Um, you should know that if the fiscal office gets that permission and they are allowed to share it with the agencies, they still won't share it with anyone else. They, even if they know I've gotten this amendment that I'm preparing a fiscal note for and the committee has given me permission to share it with the department, perhaps Milk Champion, who you saw today, they're not going to tell the lobbyists for the casinos what that amendment says and give them the exact text. They're only gonna share it with the department and agencies if that's the permission we get up front. But I'm sure they can speak about that more. So those were the major topics that I wanted to get across today. Sam and I discussed are very important for you to hear from us, the nonpartisanship and confidentiality policies. The handouts that I was looking at and reading from are all, like I said, available on the orientation materials page. If you look through those and have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And now I'd like to turn it over to the fiscal office staff. Thanks, Janet. So with us today, it looks like we've got both uh, Suzanne Voynick and Michael Russo from OFPR, so welcome. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start. I think Michael's going to go through sort of the overview of who we are. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Suzanne Voynick. We're in the Office of Fiscal and Program Review. Um, we're located in the State House. I happen to be in the building today, but I'm not always. We're in room 226 of the Capitol building. Um, the best way to reach us, we do have somebody answering the phone every day. So if you call the office, they'll get a message to me, or you could email me, which is probably the best way to try to try to reach us. Um, the areas that I cover are defense, so anything related to veterans, um, and the Secretary of State, so election issues would be in one of my areas as well. So with that, unless I have anything to add, when Michael talks, I will turn it over to Michael. Hi everyone, uh, Michael Russo. I'm also from the Office of Fiscal and Program Review. Uh, just a brief overview of what we do. Uh, OFPR is part of the nonpartisan staff of the legislature. We do all the fiscal monitoring, analysis, and reporting for you. Uh, we staff the AFA committee, which is the Appropriations and Financial Affairs, and we also provide individual staffing to policy committees. Um, we're primarily focused on looking at the budget and doing fiscal tracking of all legislation. 
Uh, that's where you'll hear about fiscal notes. Uh, we use fiscal notes to do tracking of all legislation and it talks about its impact. Uh, so they're a brief description of the impact on state government. They can include costs, savings, revenue increases or decreases, and also costs that may be incurred by local units of government called mandates. Uh, that's just a mandate preamble and, and information will identify that. It's for you to discuss though. Um, why would we use fiscal notes, you might be asking. Uh, they provide independent, unbiased, accurate, and objective information to help you, legislators, understand the fiscal impact of any proposed legislation. Uh, that description is important for keeping a balanced budget, which is a constitutional requirement. Uh, the fiscal notes, uh, combined with certain tabling and tracking procedures, allow the legislature to coordinate the fiscal impact of individual bills within the budgetary process and maintain that balanced budget going forward. And the primary, the primary tool of that when you're dealing with general fund is the special appropriations table. You might hear of that in a negative connotation. I assure you it's not. What the special appropriations table is, is a, we take all the bills that have a general fund impact, set them aside so they can be considered all at once instead of a first past the post system. Uh, so that way the first bill doesn't get all the funding and everyone else is left out of it. All the bills get considered at the same time so that they can all be uh, weighed against each other, essentially. Now, when we develop our fiscal notes, we use a variety of information uh, we have department contacts that we usually reach out to. Janet talked about how that's all confidential. Um, so we try and discuss with them to get an idea of what they're thinking. Um, we usually try and get to an agreement with them. However, there are situations where we don't agree with what they're saying and, and OFPR kind of has the final word on what we would put into a fiscal note. Uh, we also have access to all the state accounting systems. So anything an agency can see, we can see too. Uh, the only thing that we don't have access to and it doesn't apply to this committee is licensing, um, so leads, Moses, things like that. Uh, we can't access those because they deal with personal information. Uh, aside from that, we also talk to industry people. Uh, lobbyists do come in and talk to us. Um, they provide information to us. We'll, we'll read through it. Uh, just because it's been given doesn't mean that we'll be putting it into a bill. So that's the type of thing that we would do. Uh, everything we do usually shows up in the appropriations and allocation section. So that's the section of the bill where the information that the bill wants to do is told. That's what gives instructions to the rest of the state to carry out this out and do it this way. Um, aside from that, I would recommend, if you have some time, to check out the fiscal note manual. There's some exciting plot twists in that when it comes to fiscal notes. Uh, there's also a budget process manual. As the budget starts to get talked about, that'll be very helpful in understanding, well, what is this? Why are we doing it? How is it involved? Uh, that describes how the budget is prepared and what we do or in regards to that. Uh, the other things I would recommend reading are the compendium of state fiscal information. Uh, seven out of 10 times when someone comes up to me and asks me a question about a bill or a program or a fee, I'm gonna open that up and show you the page where it's on. Uh, it has everything and everything that we can find and we put it into a form for everyone to use. Uh, after that, the revenue forecasting report is gonna be extremely helpful. We've heard that discussed a lot this summer. Uh, the revenue forecasting report took away some revenue and then as the pandemic progressed we started adding it back in and we realized that the uh, economic impact wasn't going to be as bad so if you're wondering where revenues come from that's where it comes from that's what describes where we think it's going to start where it's going to end and the last thing i'd recommend is the municipal funding report uh, it describes uh, funding that all municipalities get from the state we go through and look at everything from environment natural resources to uh, state and local aid. Uh, it's all in a easy to read report so you can see what's happening. Aside from that, if you have any questions, prepare. Great, thanks. I, wanna, I just wanna add that all of those documents are on our website. So if you go into the legislature's website that Janet showed you, you can click into OFPR and there are publications listed on the left-hand side so you can access them all that way. Uh, I, I do want to give a plug to the compendium that OFPR puts together. That's very helpful, especially if you're thinking about um, different gambling topics. I just want to share my screen and show you the most helpful page that is in that compendium for me anyway. Hopefully it works. So this is what the compendium looks like. Um, you can find it, like they said, on the OFPR webpage. And then if you turn to page, what number is it? It's on the bottom, 62. They have this most amazing chart that tells you where all of the revenue 
um, goes and the taxes from the casino in Bangor and in Oxford. And I just find this chart to be so helpful. So I'm putting in a plug for using that chart. Yeah, it's great. Our, our committee tends to make a lot of revenues actually between the gambling side and the liquor side. It's been outperforming, I think, with COVID. Um, so we'll probably work more with you both next week, I guess, in the supplemental budget. And um, are there any questions from the committee members to OFPR? All right. Seeing none, thanks for jumping on. Suzanne right. Michael. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, see ya. <laughs> Bye. I didn't know if at this time, if Karen wanted to introduce herself and maybe give um, some examples of what she can do for the committee. And I should have warned her, but I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay, Janet. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Montel, and this is my fifth year um, with VLA. Um, I started in the 128th. Prior to that, though, I was here 20, 25 years earlier, and I was committee clerk in this very room for natural resources, which is now ENR. Um, I'm excited to be back. Obviously, like everyone else, I can't wait till we're all in person and we can really get to know each other. I'm here to help. Um, generally, my duties are to make sure that you have um, your files in front of you, the information that you need. I work closely with Janet. Um, we, she filters a lot of her information to me and I make sure that you have your schedules and um, you have what you need for meetings or if you need a file um, pulled for that you might take to the floor of the, the House or the Senate. I'm happy to help with that. Um, I do a lot of the behind the scenes work. And um, I will say my job has changed a great deal in, uh, due to COVID, but I'm adjusting and, um, and uh, I look forward to, to the 130th. So thank you. I'm glad to see everyone. Great, thanks, Karen. Glad to have you back. Thank you. And so that's that kind of covers the our committee staff. We have a great team um, put together that are super helpful whenever you need anything. Um, Janet, do we want to do the committee rules or? Senator Lucchini. After Representative McCray. Representative McCray has a question, I believe. My bad. <laughs> well, we have fun on VLA. Um, <laughs> I just, I may have missed it, but do we have the Zoom for Monday's meeting? And if not, can we get it? And if the we Zoom link or? I will, I will send it out when we're done. Sure. Did, did I miss it? No. Okay, good. Never mind. Thank you. It's hard to keep track of all the various Zoom links right now, especially <laughs> with a couple committees. So I, it's, uh, it's tough to follow. <laughs> Uh, Representative McCrate did ask me if I could put together a little guideline on how you can take your Zoom link and from the email and put it in your calendar using the legislature's um, web-based email system if you go on the web. Um, I did put that together. I just have it sent out to some of my colleagues here in OPLA to make sure it makes sense. And I did a lot of cutting and pasting from my own email and I wanted to make sure I wasn't revealing anything confidential that I didn't notice. So they're double checking that for me before I send it to you. But I did put that together. So hopefully you'll get it soon. Great, thanks. Did you want me to go over rules now? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so Janet sent out the model committee rules from the presiding officers in the COVID addendum uh, on an email, I think. So we should all have it. Um, we can go through it now or later, Janet, whatever works. I'm happy to go through it a little bit. Um, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen again because I, um, I found it a little bit difficult personally. I'm not saying that you all did, but I personally found it a little bit difficult to switch back and forth between the committee rules and the addendum and what exactly was being changed and what wasn't. So um, hopefully this document will help. I haven't posted it online or emailed it out to you because I hand annotated the rules and it's not an official um, document. So I don't know if I'm allowed to share it out 
widely, but I'll check with our director and get back to you if you want a copy. But this is just to basically help you um, understand. For people who are new to maybe the legislature and the committee process, this top box at the top tells you that these model committee rules were prepared by the presiding officers and the committee may by majority vote um, make amendments to these rules and notify the presiding officers. What the box doesn't tell you is that the presiding officers have to actually approve the changes to the committee rules. You don't automatically get to make changes. And I do have an example in case you wondered of a change that hasn't been approved in the past. And that was, there was um, one committee that wanted to prohibit wearing hats in the committee room last year and that um, request was denied. So they don't automatically grant every change. I think today what the chairs wanted to do was to just orient you to the committee rules and but not necessarily get into the discussions and voting on any potential changes. I think that'll be for a future day unless the chairs direct otherwise. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right, Jana. We just wanna make it, I mean, usually it's a pretty standard thing that we do with the committee rules, um, but where this is such a different session, there are some changes. Um, usually the only change we make is to allow people to eat you know, with schedules, but um, there, with the addendum and moving to a virtual um, format, it's good to highlight some of those differences and then we'll let people take a look at it before we vote it. Yeah, so I will highlight the differences, but also some of the major rules. So the chair presides at the meeting, that's the Senate chair, and in the Senate chair's absence, the House chair presides over the meeting. And rule two says that a quorum is seven members of the committee, one of whom must be a senator. When the um, legislature meets um, during the same weeks that the committees are meeting, this sometimes can be an issue where everybody's jumping around and in all different places. And um, Senator Lucchini will often be seen running down the hall and trying to get enough people into the room to start the meeting. He's very good at tracking people down. Um, <laughs> I highlighted here the word present because the addendum defines what the word present means. So seven members of the committee have to be present to start the meeting. And um, you'll see that word present used several times throughout the rules in the addendum. And present is defined in the COVID addendum to the rules as attending the meeting by, via the Zoom platform. So it doesn't matter, matter whether you're in the committee room or not, being in the committee room and not on the Zoom platform doesn't count as present. Being outside of the committee room doesn't mean you're absent. You just have to be on the Zoom platform. That counts as being present and your identity has to be visually verifiable on that platform. So when we started today at 9.30, most people had their videos off. We weren't present until we clicked them on and we were visually verifiable that we were on the Zoom platform and you could see who we were. Um, other things important on this, you don't need a quorum to adjourn, but you do need a quorum for all other votes. So if there's a work session and a vote needs to be taken, we need seven people on the Zoom platform, visually verifiable, and one of them needs to be a senator. Um, at the bottom of this page, it says, it's every committee member's responsibility to notify the committee clerk, that's Karen, whenever you're unable to attend a public hearing or work session. This rule still applies even in the remote um, committee meeting world so you should notify Karen ahead of time according to these model rules. Scheduling of hearings and work sessions, the important part of this, is, and I alluded to it earlier this afternoon, is that the Senate chair with the agreement of the House chair is in charge of scheduling public hearings and work sessions and other committee meetings and so while Sam and I do help in that process, it is up to them and then Karen makes it all actually happen by posting it everywhere it needs to go and making sure people have the notice they need. The committee's only allowed to meet on authorized meeting days, which are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, unless we get an exception to that. And as Senator Lucchini said, it's usually Monday and Wednesday as far as possible to respect people's Fridays. Public hearings do have to be advertised two weekends in advance of the hearing date. That's why you might've already seen the public hearing notice in your inbox for a hearing that doesn't happen until the first week of February. That's just the way it works to give the public enough in advance notice. Um, you can see in paragraph D here, all of um, Karen's responsibilities and she really does make the schedule actually happen after the chairs decide what it will be. Um, ordinarily, she would post the weekly schedule which you'll receive 
hopefully later today um, for next week, she would post that in paper format outside of the committee room, but under the COVID addendum, she's required to post it on the committee's webpage. She's actually been doing this all along, but that's what the COVID addendum says. Instead of posting it outside the room, post it on the webpage. Um, as far, another important thing for me to mention here, questions of order. Under the joint rules, the presiding chair decides all questions of order. So do we need a motion to reconsider here? We have a tie vote, what happens? Um, that's up to the presiding chair. It is not up to the OPLA analyst. Sometimes analysts are um, viewed as a potential resource to help answer those questions of order. And the best we can do for you is tell you how we've seen other committees resolve those questions. We are not what is called parliamentarians who um, give you advice on how the rules should be interpreted. So um, when the chairs have questions, they can refer to the parliamentarians for the legislature who are um, Clerk Hunt and Secretary um, Grant, um, but they're not OPLA, <laughs> just so that you know. Smoking, which is a funny thing, smoking restrictions have to be right in the rules, but they are. Smoking and eating restrictions on the bottom of page two and the top of page three, as Senator Lucchini said, these are the only rules that the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee attempted to amend um, during the last session. It's not clear to me how you all are going to want to address the eating um, restrictions in the rules because they are written in a way that they talk about what can happen in committee rooms and many of you won't be physically in the committee room when we're doing these Zoom meetings. Um, so I think that's something for you, you all to consider and maybe discuss further in the future. As far as the procedure for public hearings, there are several changes here made by the COVID addendum. But um, at first in paragraph A, it ordinarily says that everybody who's testifying announces their name, residence and affiliation prior to testifying. And they also have to sign a sheet of paper and put that information down um, where people aren't going to be testifying in person in the committee room, they'll be testifying on Zoom. The COVID addendum says instead of having everybody sign that, the clerk is going to maintain a record of all of that information and place it in the committee master file. Again, these are my annotations. That's not exactly word for word what the COVID addendum says, but that's what I believe it means. Um, it says also that um, B, you're supposed to address people by their titles. So you might um, meet me in person and say, hey, Janet, call me Louie, but I'm not going to call you Louie in the meeting. I'm going to call you Senator Lucchini or um, Representative Kaz. I'm not going to call you Chris. I probably will have difficulty even in person calling you by your first name because my parents drilled that into my head to use people's titles and I would start twitching if I tried not to. I don't think you've ever called me by my first name. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Um, let's see, um, another thing that's changed in the addendum, usually people are directed to bring 20 paper copies of anything that they're presenting to the committee at the public hearing, and that requirement's been removed, um, and they aren't, we aren't providing paper copies of anything currently under our guidance from our um, executive director and the presiding officers, so people who are testifying don't have to provide that um, if they do submit their testimony online through the electronic portal, you're going to get it in your email inbox anyway. So that's how you'll be receiving it. Um, paragraph D, this again, remember this is the rule about public hearings. It does say all questions must be addressed through the chair. I believe currently the chairs have asked you to use the raised hand function, but that may change over time. Um, but during a hearing, you do have to address your questions through the chair and the COVID addendum says that you have to ask the question orally, which means you can't ask questions via the chat function. And you can only ask a question if you're present at the meeting. That's the word used in the addendum. And remember present means that you're on the Zoom platform and you're visually verifiable. Um, paragraph E has some important things for maybe new, newer um, legislators to read about the types of questions that are allowed at public hearings. And the last sentence um, is something that's come up several times in the past in other committees. And I've heard from my um, fellow analysts that has come up with other committees is that the rule says a primary sponsor of a legislative document, so a bill or a resolve and anybody 
on the committee who testifies for or against it ordinarily should refrain from questioning other witnesses. Um, that's the language. Some committees have been able to change that in the past to say that they can fully participate. Others have changed it in the past to say they can't ask any questions at all, not just ordinarily, but never. So that's something for you all to consider. Right, and I, and I think the point of that rule and that whole paragraph E is just to make sure that we don't create kind of a hostile environment at the public hearing. We're not arguing or debating people of the public who come in. We just are there to listen basically. So it's easy to happen, especially if you're the sponsor of the bill and somebody's trashing it, you'll wanna <laughs> give it back to them, but it's probably not appropriate at the hearing. So it's a, it's a, it's a good rule. Paragraph F is a, a, a little bit of a funny one because it says that committee members and members of the public should not be making or receiving phone calls during public hearings. I've worked for committees where they amend that rule and they say that if your phone rings during the meeting, you owe a $5 fine and then the committee uses that to buy candy. That might not really work in this environment, but it's just a funny thing people have amended in the past and it's been approved. There are some changes to rule eight, which is the rule governing work sessions. Um, it still says that all questions have to be addressed through the chair, but just as in a public hearing environment, those questions have to be asked orally when you're recognized by the chair, not via the chat function, and you have to be present at the work session to ask the question, which means on the Zoom platform and visually verifiable. Under paragraph B, there is a little bit of explanation. So that paragraph says that anyone who's not the committee analyst or um, a committee member ordinarily can't participate in the work session except at the invitation of the chair. The um, addendum explains that the word participate includes by making comments in the Zoom chat or using other Zoom functions. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. That's being changed this year. The next rule, rule number nine, goes through the different kinds of reports, which when I started working for the legislature, that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know if this was some kind of a book report, but it actually just means your vote, whether you're voting that the bill should pass, should pass, but with an amendment, should not pass, or a different vote like that. They're all listed out here under A. That's what the committee report is. There could be majority reports, minority reports. There's been three, four, or even five way different reports if people split along um, different lines because they have different ideas for how that bill should move forward or not. Um, there's a rule here about when you can take votes, not after 10.30 p.m. or before 7.30 unless first authorized jointly by the presiding officers. You might look at that and think, oh, that never comes up. But there have been long um, days in the past, I luckily haven't been staffing them, um, when those rules have had to be invoked and they've had to ask for presiding officer permission to take a late vote. For example, a long complicated bill or one with a lot of people and they wanted to give everybody a chance to speak or weigh in. Um, paragraph D talks about who can cast a vote at a work session. Uh, it actually is written currently in, in the old model rules about um, what happens if you're present versus when you're absent. But remember present, as far as being able to vote, you have to be on Zoom and visually verifiable, which means if you're not on Zoom, even if you're in a committee room, or if you're not showing um, yourself so that you're visually verifiable, then you are absent for the purposes of taking the vote at that work session. Um, if you are absent, under D1, you have up until noon, the second business day following the vote to register your vote in um, pre-COVID world. That meant you would go up to, to Karen's desk in the committee room and you would ask her what votes did I miss and she would give you the vote sheets and you would pick which side and you would sign your initials and you'd cast your vote, but you can't do that now. Um, or you may not want to do that now because of the pandemic. So the COVID addendum says that you may register your vote with the clerk by electronic means, but it doesn't change the, the deadline of noon, the second business day. Um, in addition, the addendum has um, a paragraph on voting. It's not clear to me where it belongs in the rules. So I just stuck it here on the bottom of this page. The vote must be taken in a manner that allows people watching or observing the committee meeting to see or hear the vote, so that means you can't vote on chat because people can't see or hear that who are watching. 
and it has to show how each member present votes. So again, by using that word present to be able to vote, they're talking about being on Zoom and visually verifiable. Um, paragraph E at the top of the next page, this is not changed by um, the COVID addendum, but it's something that's important for new people to the legislature to know and even veterans to be reminded of. In accordance with the joint rules, minority reports have to be voted on at the same work session as the majority report. And a, com a committee vote to report a bill favorably must be taken on written language before the committee at that time or on a motion describing the content of the report. So when there's a work session, perhaps there's a proposed amendment that's been presented, the vote is taken, and perhaps even a majority of the committee votes for that amendment, but somebody votes, no, I'm opposing that amendment, I will always stop the meeting and ask, can you please tell me the content of your minority report? And you have to be able to describe to the committee, you don't need the language ready, but you need to describe to the committee what it is that you want differently ought not to pass or an amendment that maybe changes a couple of things. Um, so the reason I'm asking that is not to be annoying, it's because it's required by the model rules. Um, it also helps me draft the amendment because if I don't know what's in it, I can't draft it, just to be honest. Um, paragraph G, this is the process where the committee clerk prepares the committee jacket. That's actually literally a brown jacket that goes around outside the bill and any amendments that the committee makes to it. Karen can describe it much better than I can, but there are sheets that after the amendments all prepared and ready to go that she has to get people to sign, whether they're on this amendment or a different amendment or whether they voted out not to pass. And ordinarily, again, that's going to Karen, or usually she tracks you down. She's very good at finding you and she gets you to sign it. And now the addendum says that the clerk can obtain the member's approval by electronic means as required. So I'm not entirely sure what those electronic means are. Um, if we need to investigate that for you, when the time comes, we will. Probably Karen will hopefully be given um, direction on that, but that's what the addendum says. So don't feel that once the votes start being taken, you are required to come in just for the purposes of signing the jackets. There will be electronic means available for that. The rest, um, except for the very last page, there aren't any changes from the addendum, but things worth knowing about the procedures for the review of nom gubernatorial nominations. It's our understanding that there are many nominations forthcoming now that the legislature is back in session. Um, all of those nomination processes are highly regulated by the constitution and statutes and they are considered a partisan process. So Sam and I will not be able to assist you with those. We can tell you when they're scheduled for, we can help the chairs remember to schedule them. Karen does all of the heavy legwork on that. I'm not gonna pretend I do. She calls everybody, finds out all their schedules and makes the miracle of it happen, happen. But um, that is not something that our office assists with other than to remind the chairs to make sure the schedule happens. And then the only other change from the addendum is on the last page here where it reminds everybody that the copy of the committee rules has to be posted in the committee room and available for public review in ordinary times. But now the committee rules and the addendum have to be posted on the committee webpage. So after you all in the future, I believe not today, discuss and vote on the changes you might want to make to the committee rules. Um, Sam and I will draft up those changes as amendments to the rules as you've seen them. We'll send it off to the presiding officers signed by your chairs, and they'll decide whether they agree or disagree with the different amendments. They'll send them back, you'll get an approval, and ordinarily that's supposed to be posted in the committee room, but instead we'll make sure it's posted on that committee material page we showed you before so that people will know what rules govern the committee process in the Veterans Legal Affairs Committee. Great, thank you, Janet. And I figured it'd probably be best for everybody just to take a look at this over the weekend and the addendum that's with it. So we don't really need, obviously we won't vote it today. Um, but if anybody has questions now, um, you can ask Janet or we can you know, deal, we can discuss and vote this next week once we've had a chance to dig further into the addendum changes uh, based on the virtual model, so. I guess seeing no questions, um, I think that pretty much is it for today's 
agenda. Um, so Janet, it looks like we are scheduled for Monday at 9 a.m. Is that right? With a briefing from, uh, we're gonna have the Office of Marijuana Policy, the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations um, on Monday. So two departments under our jurisdiction. And then Janet's also gonna do a, an optional um, briefing for anybody who's interested um, just about uh, reading bills. Um, really helpful uh, presentation. So does that sound right, Janet? So 9 a.m.? I never know if I have the latest updated schedule. Is that That is correct. Um, we'll make sure, Karen and I will make sure that you get the weekly by the end of the day today. Uh, I, I did want to let you know, Karen wouldn't say this to you, but I don't think she's left her desk for lunch in two or three weeks since she started. So um, if things are taking a little bit of time, it's not because we're not working really, really hard. It's just there are so many more things to do than you could ever possibly imagine. But we will get you that schedule as soon as we can. And it is um, Monday at 9 a.m. for those briefings, followed by the optional presentation. I think Wednesday, we're hoping to start at 10, 10.30. Some things had to be moved around. So ordinarily, I think the chairs want to start at 10 but uh, it'll be 1030. And even then, I think we're giving me too much time. So we might have a pause. Yeah, yeah, we've got the Department of Defense uh, coming in at 1130. That was the time that works best for them. Obviously, they're incredibly busy with their COVID response and everything. So um, yeah, we have 1030 slated to start. We don't want to start early and then just pause. So hopefully that'll give us good time for, for people. And then as um, others have mentioned, the supplemental budget, the joint hearing with AFA is on Thursday. It is very difficult for me to tell you exactly what time the way that the appropriations committee has done it is they've broken the budget into blocks. And so on Thursday at 1 p.m., there's a block that includes criminal justice, um, areas of the budget within the criminal justice committee's jurisdiction, areas of the budget within the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee's jurisdiction, and then also Judiciary Committee. And so we'll follow whenever the Criminal Justice Committee's topics end. And I can't tell you now what time that'll be, but it'll be sometime after one. You can either join the Zoom and just sort of be with your video off in the background for a while, or you can watch it on YouTube and then join in later. I think that's how, for example, Director Wayne did it today. He was able to come in pretty quickly. So I think you have options there of how you want to do it. You should have that Zoom link already. If you don't, let us know. Great, thanks. So that's, and we're not looking at anything on Friday next week, so. And then the following week, we'll start with all the bills that we just got um, with the two week notice, we had to, to bump it out to the first week of February. So any questions from anybody before we wrap up for the day? All right. Oh. Yep, uh, Representative Wood. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say this was my first committee meeting in the legislature, <laughs> and I appreciate all the help. And Janet, you're fantastic. And Karen, it sounds like you're going to be fantastic. But I also wanted to say I haven't met Senator Farron or Representative Kinney or Representative Harrington before today. And I'm really looking forward to, to working with you. And um, just thanks for everybody being very welcoming. Thanks, yeah, we've always had a, a good rapport in this committee. You know, it's, it tends to be pretty bipartisan. Sometimes partisan issues come up, but we tend to vote them quickly and send it to the floor and let people, you know, fight it out down there rather than do it up here. But. With committee work, it's important that we, you know, get it right up here and then it makes much better bills when it hits the floor because it's harder to change once it gets down there. Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to um, sort of express that like Senator Farron, I think who's also on transportation and Senator Deschambeau that had mentioned that she's also gonna be in criminal justice. I'm gonna be in AFA as well. It is good that we've got this meeting coming up where I can be in both meetings at the same time time hopefully we have a little bit more of that but um i'm gonna try to be with you guys as as much as possible so right i'm sure you'll get pretty busy usually when we have somebody doubling on afa towards the end of the session it's they kind of disappear for a while <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm the new brian hubble right he did That's it right <laughs> committee, so. yeah 
Great. Anything else? Uh, I don't know if Chairman Cayazzo has anything to add or you good? Sure. I, I just like to add it. It is great to see everybody um, faces for the first time for, for some of you. Um, I've been keeping track. And since betting does fall under this committee, um, Senator Lucchini and I are each one for one for improper name pronunciations. So maybe we can start taking odds on favor by the end of the session now to see, uh, <laughs> to see who, who comes out ahead of that. But um, looking forward to working with all of you for sure. Um, I, I think, you know, we're, hopefully we can have some fun and, and enjoy ourselves, but get, get a lot of good work done too. So, so thank you for everybody for participating today for sure. Um, um, you know, we're, we'll, we'll get through this for sure. We, you know, there's some little hiccups here and there, but uh, I think everybody's intent is to do good work. And I think we're in a good position to do that with the help of Janet and Karen and all the fantastic staff behind us. They really do make us all, make us all look good. So, so I appreciate meeting everybody and look forward to doing a lot of work with you guys. Great. And so I guess not seeing anything else. Uh, thanks everybody for coming on today and uh, we'll see everybody on Monday. So, we'll have a good weekend now. Yep, have a good one.